Everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to the RUSD Board of Education meeting for Thursday, November 16, 2023. I call our meeting to order at 4 p.m. This meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD YouTube channel. And if you would like to view the meeting on our Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, which can be found on our website at riversideunified.org. Our meeting today will be held in the boardroom at the Riverside Adult School, and it is open to the public. I'll now turn to Dr. Hernandez Alexander if we have a quorum present. Yes, Mr. President, we have a quorum. And do we have any public cards for public input on closed session items? No, we do not. Okay, then I adjourn the meeting at a close, uh, uh, to closed session um, at 4 p.m., and we will return at 5.30 p.m. for open session. Thank you.
afternoon and welcome to the RUSD Board of Education meeting for Thursday, November 16th, 2023. I'm reconvening our Board of Education meeting at 5.30 p.m. This meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD YouTube channel. And if you would like to view the meeting on our Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, which can be found on our website at riversideunified.org. Our meeting today will be held in the boardroom at the Riverside Adult School and is open to the public. A limited overflow meeting room with a television monitor will be available if the main boardroom meets capacity. And as always, the meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD board meeting YouTube channel. For members of the public who would like to address the board, please see a staff member at the entrance and they will assist you. I'd like, like to take this opportunity to welcome our term two student board member, Bibi Naz Nami. Is, is she here? Okay, she'll be back. Who is a senior from John W. North High School. So welcome, Bibi Naz. And please, uh, uh, we'll give her an opportunity to introduce herself at the board member comments. Uh, I'd also like to take a report on the board uh, actions during closed session. Uh, we took action uh, relative to real property negotiations with respect to item C to uh, the board by vote of four to zero with Trustee Lee, Kinnear, myself and Dr. Hernandez Alexander voting AI and Trustee Hunt being uh, absent. Approved purchase agreements for 2993 14th Street and 2945 14th Street, neither of which have been fully signed by the other party. Accordingly, details of the transaction and copies of the agreements will be released on request once the agreement is fully executed. And then also the board voted four to uh, zero to approve a resignation agreement for one classified manager, 170051. Uh, by, uh, votes from myself, uh, I, uh, voted I, Trustee Kinnear, Trustee Lee, Trustee uh, Dr. Hernandez Alexander, and one abstention from Trustee Hunt. Uh, at this time, our Pledge of Allegiance. Absent instead of abstention, correct. At this time, our Pledge of Allegiance will be provided by video and will f feature Jonathan Games Bazan, who is a sixth grade student from Pachapa Elementary School. Johnny participates in Primary Buddies, where he helps TK and kinder students get acclimated to new routines and activities. Johnny is a roaring example of optimism, and he interacts with both adults and peers with genuine interest and joy. Pachapa Tiger Town is very proud of him. Hi, my name is Johnny and I'm a sixth grade here at Pachapa and I'm going to read you the pledge. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That was the fastest <laughs> pledge we've ever had. <laughs> Okay. Uh, we'll now have our uh, student performance. I'm happy to share that we have the pleasure of hearing a live student performance here in the boardroom tonight. Uh, 12th grade student Robert Marshall will be performing a number for us. So welcome, Robert. Good evening, President Farouk and Superintendent Hill and members of the board. I'm Robert Marshall. I go to John W. North High School as a 12th grader, and I perform in the Blue Star Regiment under Mr. Pete Jackson, and I have also performed in the Honors Musical and Honors Performing Arts Experience under Mr. Spencer Kalman. Uh, I've been playing percussion at RUSD because it gives me a sense of purpose, and with this purpose and experience, I have won the principal chair at the Pacific Youth Symphony Orchestra, and I've participated in the Allstate and All Southern Bands here in California. My plan for the future is to attend RCC as a music major, and tonight I will be performing Bach's first cello suite, arranged for marimba. Thank you.
What a great job by uh, Robert Marshall with that great performance of uh, Bach. I'm just going to wait one moment while, while we exit the, the equipment. Okay, well, that was incredible. So uh, we'll now uh, turn to inviting our stellar group of high school students uh, to provide reports on their different school sites. Uh, we'll start with Samantha Nava from Arlington High School. Welcome, Samantha. Good evening, President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and board members. My name is Samantha Nava, I am a senior, and I am the president of Arlington's Associated Student Body. I am pleased to be back representing Arlington High School to share some of the ways we are implementing our ASB mission statement throughout our campus community. Our ASB mission statement reads as follows. I understand that leadership starts with me, but it's not about me. That it is my responsibility to create school spirit. That I have the opportunity to serve my campus and community, and that I will find ways to shine the spotlight on others. The three goals our ASB program has been focusing on since the last time I was here are to be more inclusive through clubs and programs, promote staff involvement, and lastly, to showcase and recognize students on campus. With, res with respect to the first goal to be more inclusive through clubs and programs, Arlington hosted a Dia de los Muertos event for everyone in our community to celebrate and view death as a welcomed part of life. Clubs like Multilingual Learners, JROTC, AVID, Theater, GSA, Jewelry Club, AHS Wellness Peer Educators, and Cooking Club created altars and displayed them in our main gym to honor their loved ones. Each altar had ofrendas, which represents a remembrance of the club or program's theme. ASB also made some beautiful posters. Students enrolled in our Spanish world language courses provided handmade marigolds. Students in our science classes made sugar school banners to decorate, and many more. During lunch, our Lion community came to watch our very own Ballet Folklorico perform, and after, they joined them on the dance floor with some traditional cultural music. Arlington wants all our students to be represented, and this is one way students of all cultures can learn about how other cultures celebrate. Another way we are achieving this goal is by our PALS Main Coffee Club. This club offers the students with special needs the opportunity to utilize technology and hands-on vocational skills. Staff members have the opportunity to order fresh hot coffee, tea, and or hot chocolate. And our PAL students are in charge of making the drinks and delivering them. As someone who is not involved in this club, but sees the PALs come into my classes and deliver the staff drinks, it truly does put a smile on my face as well as my peers. With regards to our second goal, a way our campus promoted staff involvement was by hosting a staff versus student basketball game and assisting our counseling department with an annual college and career kickoff event. The college and career event was hosted by our counselors during lunch and included numerous information booths from local universities, colleges, businesses, and agencies. The student staff basketball game was a fundraising partnership for Link Crew and the boys basketball program. The goal was to bring staff and students together to encourage, sorry, to engage in a fun activity to help facilitate a united culture between students and staff. Many staff volunteered to play in the game, help provide supplies, and help oversee the students as they organized the event. Multiple programs on campus came together to make the event happen, and that collaboration helped foster great relationships between our student leaders and multiple staff members on campus. In terms of our third goal, and in our efforts to showcase and recognize students on campus, our staff members continue to recognize a student of the month and reward students with paw points for exemplifying positive behaviors. Our PBS store, The Main Marketplace, will open for a single redemption day this Friday and again the week prior to finals. Our PBS program also recently recognized our Latin honor students from the 2023 second semester. At each pep rally, we also continue to recognize the students who earned the highest amount of paw points and congratulate them on serving as leaders on our campus. This month, we also hosted another installment of our Pride Council, a student leadership advisory board where students meet to promote inclusive and equitable practices on campus. 
This is an amazing way to get students' feedback and to grow as a high school. We want students to know that they are heard. Lastly, I want to share that our Golden Pride Marching Band and Color Guard have qualified to compete in the 2023 Southern California School Band and Orchestra Association Field Championships in the 3A Division this coming Saturday. It is a tremendous accomplishment for our band and Color Guard to be recognized as one of the top 12 programs in Southern California for their division, and we wanted to wish them a good luck. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to share about our amazing campus, and I look forward to bringing more information to you next time. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Samantha. Great job. Our, our next student representative is Nicole Figueroa from Martin Luther King High School. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Fruk, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed members of the board. It is truly an honor to be here. Once again, I am Nicole Figueroa, and I proudly represent Martin Luther King High School as your student board representative. Fall has been extremely busy at Martin Luther King High, one of our first events being homecoming with an under the sea theme, marking the beginning of October. Our homecoming court process was also carefully revised by our ASB to be more inclusive. Instead of mostly athlete nominations, teachers are now able to nominate students in several different categories, such as athletics, extracurricular, academic, and VAPA, visual and performing arts, and a winner from each area was chosen to provide a royal court. Our football team is still in the game, as we are scheduled to play in the semifinal on Friday, November 17th. If we win, we will be playing in the, the Division 7 championships the week of Thanksgiving. We also congratulate our other sports achievements, such as our boys and girls cross country team heading to CIF finals and our girls tennis team advancing to the semifinals in the CIF team competition. Our clubs and VAPA or visual performing arts organizations have been flourishing as well. Our amazing group of thespians had their first play title, The Brothers Grimm Spectac Spectacular Gone, excuse me, and has now opened up auditions for their spring musical, The Little Mermaid. Our choir also had their fall concert and is currently playing their winter concert for December 5th. Our band is also at the home stretch of their marching season and is all set to go to the SCSBOA Field Championships for Division 6A on Saturday, November 18th. Fall also marks the beginning of college application season, and King has offered an abundance of resources to students such as college application assistance every Wednesday, a college and career center week from the 23rd and 27th of October, and various presentations from institutions such as USC, RCC, UCLA, and the USC Navy. Wednesday, November 15th, MLKHS had athletes sign letters of intent to play college athletics as well. There have also been some new additions or revisions this season. Frosting all different types of relationships is an important skill and task that King has prioritized since its opening in 1999. Our administration team and staff got the chance to foster and actively build new relationships with our new three assistant principals. They're amazing. To further my point of rebuilding relationships on King's campus, our principal, Dr. Iconi, gathered a student advisory council to gain insight from all students of all different backgrounds, such as transfer students, VAPA members, athletes, McKinney Vento foster youth, extracurricular members, and students from a plethora of different classes. Our campus is also undergoing beautification to create a more welcoming environment for our students. Lights on the buildings around campus are, were repainted, Murals, murals were replaced on the NPR in preparation for the winter sports teams, and bird nesting needles were added to deter crows. Observing King High School students in the process of working, toward, working hard towards leaving their legacy has truly been a statement of pride and honor in what our students in our school stands for. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nicole. Great job. Our next student representative is Miguel Uribe from Abraham Lincoln High School. Welcome, Miguel. Hello and good evening, Board President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed members of the board. My name is Miguel Uribe, and I'm here on behalf of Abraham Lincoln High School to bring you some updates on what is happening at our school. During the month of October, we had a series of activities prom promoting our district college and career readiness initiative. Activities include lunchtime activities, a door decorating contest, three workshops led by RCC enrollment specialists, and class presentations by our guidance tech and college and career assistant. In our sports program, our students were able to participate in a seven-on-seven -seven league, the league against other continuation schools. This is the first time we have competed in a flag football season. Students were very excited to do so, 
We have also started our softball season with the boys and girls team representing Lincoln at an alt-ed sports league. Sports program give us the opportunity to stay engaged with the school and get some exercise in the process to continue our health and uh, wellness goals. In our auto CT pathway, students are learning how to use uh, different media to access service information for vehicles and are now participating lifting cars, changing different fluids, and performing basic service procedures. These skills are essential in in earning industry standard certifications that give us the opportunity to enter the workforce as a highly qualified technician. In our Healthway CTE pathway, students just completed their CPR portion of the class. 30 students were able to get, the, get their CPR certification. These students also led to industry standard certification. More importantly, it provides us with a way, uh, a life saving skill set that we can use in our daily lives. Our AVID students went to a field trip to RCC. They also got to take a tour of the City Hall, which included getting to speak with the mayor about how to get a job in politics. We also had some lunchtime activities that supported our well-being and helped us create community with our fellow students. Activities include guest speakers from the local college and our armed forces, suicide awareness activities which promote positive uh, mental health, music, and games to continue the health and wellness team. Lastly, we had 12 female students that got to go into the Inspire Her Mind program, which helped encourage our younger female students to think about themselves as engineers, problem solvers, and scientists so that they can build their confidence for pursuing STEM fields in the future. Thank you for the opportunity to share a few highlights from our school. This concludes my report. Thank you so much, Miguel. Well done. Our next student representative is Isabella Mendez from Riverside Virtual School. Welcome, Isabella. Good evening, Board President Dr. Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and our esteemed Board of Members. I'm thrilled to announce that RVS has been actively engaged in various academic and social activities lately. Since we last spoke, we have successfully collaborated with ELC to participate in their Fall Festival that took place on October 25th. The Fall Festival was not only a great success, but also provided a wonderful opportunity for us to collaborate with ELC and further strengthen our partnership. We held our quarter one game night on October 28th and invited all trailblazers in grades 7 through 12 to play board games, card games, video games, and yard games, and enjoy a build your own nachos. At the game night event, we also took the opportunity to recognize 174 hardworking students who earned Latin honors. We celebrated their achievements by training them to an exclusive and delicious ice cream sundae station. It was a great way to acknowledge their dedication and success in a sweet and memorable way. Our guidance counselors have been working hard to support our seniors in their academic pursuits. On November 1st, we organized an event to, support, to help our students and parents get started with their FAFSA accounts, accounts and applications. Our counselors provided step-by-step -step guidance on how to create a FAFSA account in preparation of filling out the FAFSA application. They also answered any questions that our students have regarding the process. This event has been instrumental in assuring that our trailblazers are well prepared for financial, to apply for financial aid and scholarships. Furthermore, our counselors have been proactive in assuring that our students are well informed about post high school opportunities by scheduling and promoting virtual college visits and virtual meetings with the U.S. Army and other organizations. The CTE course, Costume and Makeup, and Intro to Theater recently had an exciting opportunity to take a field trip to the Riverside Fox Theater. During the trip, students worked alongside Fox Theater technicians to learn about rigging and gained hands-on experience with the light board and sound board. The students were able to get a closer look at how the counterweight system works and how to pull the ropes, which was a great learning experience for them. The field trip was an excellent Oh, sorry, the field trip was an excellent opportunity for the students to learn from professionals in the industry and gain practical skills that will help them in their future careers. The students were able to see how different elements of a performance come together to create a seamless performance. It was worth, it's worth mentioning that this field trip has been a great success in the past, with some students even applying for jobs at the Fox Theater after participating in Live Nation Take Day. Overall, the, the field trip was a fun and educational experience for the students, and we hope to continue providing such opportunities for our students in the future. We continue to focus on supporting all students by providing tiered levels of support through our Wednesday IRL events. In real life learning offers students a time to connect with their peers, teachers, and engage in club activities. The students are able to get academic support through tutoring provided by other students, teachers, and instructional aides. We encourage students to take some time 
to connect with others and strengthen their connectedness to each other and school. Our clubs have been very active in our community, both school-wise and city-wise. Our Making It Happen Science and Esports Club have been meeting during our RL events, which has helped with school unity and has given us an extra opportunity for our students to make connections with one another. Our volunteer club has been hard at work putting in their volunteer hours at Overfull Farms and will be at the Festival of Lights Litter Cleanup this weekend. We would like to thank our club advisors for ensuring that every student has the opportunity and tools to participate in club activities. Lastly, we would like to say a big thank you to Poly High School for hosting the 20th annual RUSD Leadership Exchange on November 7th. Our ASB leaders have brought back all the tips and tricks they have learned and are ready to put them to test. Thank you for having me here and I cannot wait for our next meeting. <laughs> thank you, Isabella, well done. Our last student representative is Eden Phillips from Educational Options Center. Welcome, Eden. Hello and good evening, Board President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed members of the board. My name is Eden Phillips, and I'm here on behalf of ESC to bring you some updates of what's been happening at our school. We've been promoting our positive attendance at ESC by having classrooms take part in the 21-day attendance challenge. Teachers are encouraging their students to come to school every day to ensure that they are receiving the necessary instruction from all of their classes. Participating in this attendance challenge will create the positive habit of showing up to school. Students that come to school every day between October 16th and November 13th will be invited to the party, a reward for their positive attendance. ELC has an attendance champion trophy competition. This competition is promoting positive attendance. The classroom with the highest attendance percentage for the week is given a trophy to display and hold bragging rights for the entire week. EOC is hosting random raffles for attendance. On random days, the attendance team will hand out raffle tickets to students who are in attendance, and those students, because they are in class, have the opportunity to win, to win some delicious lunchtime treats. EOC hosted our annual Lead Fall Festival, where students organized and participated in the Halloween-themed door decorating contest. Students also organized carnival-style lunchtime games that included ping pong, rock painting, ring toss, hula hoop contest, and a myriad of other fun activities. Extracurricular activities like these give the students the opportunity to interact with each other and create a positive school climate. As we continue to support and encourage our English learners, at our last ELAC meeting, 16 students were recognized for increasing their LPAC scores in the spring administration. Students and their families were invited to attend the were invited to the award ceremony where students were honored with certificates for their achievements. Refreshments and light snacks were served and provided to parents as they were able to be present and support their students as long as interact with other families. We had several students attend our college field trip to RCC where students got to take part in the tour of the campus and get information on all the course offerings and how to apply. Students were also informed about the Promise program which allows students at RCC guaranteed admission into UCR which is a big advantage. At Raincross, the model continuation application process for the school year is, is nearly completed. We have submitted the application and supporting documents are awaiting an initial visit in December. Our CTE Health Pathways teaching students how to find and log vital signs, perform various examinations including urinalysis, audiograms, and various rapid tests. Students appreciate the hands-on approach which will also help when it comes to earning industry standard certifications. Lastly, we want to congratulate our, our 15 graduates that have worked hard this semester. These students have worked hard to complete their credit goal per week to accomplish this awesome feat. Thank you for this opportunity. This concludes my report. Thank you, Eden. Great job. So that concludes our high school student representative reports. Uh, as, as it is a public meeting, you're always welcome to stay, but uh, feel free to go uh, if, if, if you like. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, so I will now turn to our district group reports. Our first gr group report tonight is provided by California School Employees Association and their president, Ms. Anayi Chang. She's unavailable tonight, and so our... Oh, okay. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, that's what I was in my notes. Uh, welcome, Ms. Chang. Thank you. That was last, last meeting. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Superintendent Renee Hill, President Angela Farouk, and distinguished board members. 
This is the last time I will be reporting out um, for the year as the chapter president for Local 506. The CSEA State Board meeting was held on October 21st at none other than Colton High School by our brothers and sisters from Chapter 244 Colton. We had the pleasure of meeting many people, including Majority Leader Eloise Gomez, Senior and former Congressman Joe Baca, his son, District Supervisor of San Bernardino, Joe Baca Jr., and Frank A. Gonzalez, former mayor from Colton. Um, he was mayor from 1971 through 2014, which I thought was very long, but hey. <laughs> um, the board reported out and discussed business as usual. It was great to see many leaders who attended from up and down California. Second, our chapter has finished the second rounds of nomination, the first and second rounds of nomination with voting in December. Good luck to all the candidates. I want to give a special shout out to the Christmas committee who includes a few new members to the team. Maria Trail, Jessica Castro, Adriana Resendez, and of course our communications officer, Ojan Sykes, Treasurer Nina Ingurgio, and past president, Joy Hurst. All of them together are working diligently to host a warm, inviting party for all of our hardworking classified members. Next, CSEA Chapter 506 is advocating for more training, communication, transparency, and a change for the evaluation process in our contract. There are steps that are being skipped in development, in the development of new employees, and I worry that the retention rate for employees here at RUSD will decline. Many time workers are thrown into these positions and set up to fail due to resources not available. Moreover, the chapter would like the opportunity for senior vets or employees with seniority who put years in commitment with aspirations of a fair chance to promote within. And we continue to stand with our brothers and sisters in the classroom advocating for more sustainable staffing. Further, we advocate for competitive wages as the surrounding districts show greater salaries for their employees. On a positive note, thank you to the payroll department for all the hard work in helping our classified employees get their well-deserved raise and retro, and retro pay sooner than expected. Josh Gregory, Kim Masakane, payroll leads, you are amazing. And payroll manager, Lauren Drake, you rock. And of course, the classified tech technicians, Lupe Torres, Nina Ingurgio, Taylor Hardy, Joanne Kershaw, Stella Garcia, and Brenda Serna. You guys are the best, and we all appreciate you. Lastly, but not least, payroll admin, Dion Diaz, Nikki Hoff, director of business, and uh, of course, super assistant, uh, intendant um, of business, but I don't see her tonight. Um, Thank you to her, too. This includes my report for Chapter 506. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Okay, and happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Chang. Thank you. Our next report is uh, from Ms. Laura Bowling, president of the Riverside City Teachers Association. Welcome, Ms. Bowling. Good evening, Executive Board President Executive Board President, Dr. Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and board members. I am pleased to share that RCTA will be awarding 20 Barbara Kerr grants to 13 different school sites across the district. We will announce those recipients at the next site rep meeting. RCTA educators applied for these grants at the beginning of the school year. The total of the grants is $21,545.65. The grants range from campus art beautification, ceramics for all, guitar club, a deep dive into ancient Egypt, and kinder playground tile mural, to name a few. The Bar Barbara Kerr grant, <clears throat> excuse me, is in honor of Barbara Kerr as past president of RCTA and CTA state president. Barbara is a fierce advocate of the arts. She continues to devote her time during her retirement to this committee and many philanthropies throughout Riverside. The RCTA executive board members have almost completed visits to every RUSD site. We have listened to our members' concerns. We continue to hear the dis discipline and safety are still at the forefront of, for our members. We look forward to continue to advocate at the bargaining table for clear expectations so our students can thrive in safe and nurturing classroom environments. On a personal note, this morning I attended the Casablanca Elementary groundbreaking ceremony. 
As a product of RUSD and Victoria Elementary School, I have a different perspective on the neighborhood of Casablanca. In the late 60s, when the original Casablanca school was closed, I was a first grader at Victoria. I remember distinctly when school started that there were new students at our school. I didn't realize at that age what segregation or what desegregation was about and how it would affect me. It brought a whole new world for this little white girl. Some of these new students would have later become lifelong friends of mine. I learned about Chicano culture by visiting their homes after school and on the weekends. I went to birthday parties and broke my first pinata. As a native Riversider, I look so forward to the new Casablanca Elementary School and my hope that it continues to represent the rich culture and opportunity for those students of that neighborhood. Lastly, I want to wish all a wonderful Thanksgiving and you stay safe and healthy until we see each other again. Thank you, Ms. Boy. We'll now have our, our superintendent comments uh, report. So, Superintendent Hill. Thank you. Since the last board meeting, I've been able to visit Mark Twain Elementary and Liberty Elementary. I remain encouraged by the instruction and student learning. This is the time of year when teachers are changing their syllabus because they have even more information about this year's students and what their needs are. And teachers have to balance two very important things. First, ensuring that grade level standards are taught throughout the year, plus providing support in prior grade standards that students have yet to master. Rounds of parent conferences have been held and the partnership between parents and teachers is critical for student success. Turning to athletics, I'd like to extend congratulations to many of our athletes who are, who are concluding their seasons. Some of our high school students spoke about that. And especially to the boys varsity football teams from Ramona, Polly, and Martin Luther King High. Each has made it to their semifinals for their respective leagues and games are played tomorrow. Winners of those games will move on to the final showdown for the CIF championship and we might even end up with a crosstown competition. <laughs> Somebody's waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, I'd like to mention two events. First, we hosted our annual State of the District event on November 2nd in a different style. This time, we extended the invitation to our entire RUSD community to learn how we partner for success. Over 300 families, employees, and community members attended and enjoyed more than 15 resource booths representing various departments, programs, and parent groups. We had phenomenal student performances, almost as good as tonight's, <laughs> uh, throughout the event. And I'd like to thank everyone who attended. If you did not have the opportunity to attend, uh, you can see it at uh, riversideunified.org slash SOTD, all caps, for State of the District to have a recap. I want to thank our Board of Education for their support and participation in, in the event. And a special thank you to Dr. Farouk, who uh, we partnered in leading the program. Another event, uh, Laura Bowling mentioned it, was the groundbreaking at Casablanca. Uh, many, many community members gathered for this historic event and we're looking toward a grand opening in 2025. So thank you to Riverside Community for investing in education and voting to pass Measure O. As I include, conclude in this season that features gratitude, I would like to express my gratitude to our RUSD families, our students, educators and employ employees for partnering with us to prioritize learning and well-being. Thank you for all you do. Enjoy your break and know that our USD is grateful for you. That includes, concludes my report. Thank you so much, uh, Superintendent Hill. At this time, members of the public may pro uh, provide comments on any items of business to be transact uh, transacted or discussed by the board that are not already listed on this evening's agenda. This board is limited to responses they may wish to offer on topics that have not been agendized, yet are permitted to ask clarifying questions as to a presenter's public comments. Uh, there was a public comment submitted through our electronic communication submission, and it's been attached to the agenda for this board meeting uh, for people wanting to uh, communicate remotely. Uh, and Dr. Hernandez-Alexander, you can, if you can please provide me comments for, that want to address us directly. We have four comments. 
starting with Janice Roots, followed by Sandy R, followed by Delin Delin Delnita. Delnita Brown, followed by Letitia Pepper. Welcome, Ms. Roots. You have three minutes. Thank you very much. Good evening, um, board members, uh, Superintendent Hill, and staff, as well as members of the audience this evening. Um, at this pivotal time within our public discourse, anti-racist Riverside, along with the NAACP, the Civil Rights Institute, uh, the Center for Social Justice and Civil Liberties, UCR Center for Social Innovation, True Evolution, the First Congregational Church, Eden Lutheran Church, and the Center Against Racism and Trauma, um, submit this co collaborative statement regarding the threats to students of color LGBTQIA plus students, and all um, California protected classes in RUSD. Um, we would like to express our support of Superintendent Renee Hill and the board members um, of the Riverside Unified School District in denouncing discrimination um, of all types and affirming equity for all students as expressed within the RUSD student handbook. We believe that every student that attends one of our USD's elementary, middle, and high schools should expect a safe and nurturing environment where they are embraced by, um, embraced for who they are and for their unique contributions to the school community. The diversity of our student population should be celebrated as it provides a valuable opportunity for students to learn about cultural differences while recognizing our common humanity. This sense of belonging provides emotional wellness, which is essential for children and youth to thrive. Our USD educators are tasked to impart a curriculum based on instructional standards. They hope, they hope to provide students with a well-rounded education that encourages acquiring trades, career certifications, college degrees, and lifelong learning. Now more than ever, classrooms are being impacted by dissent over lessons around literary classics, by demands to report a student's preferred name or gender identification, and by pollution of curriculum standards with educators' own political agendas. We hope that outside influences do not overshadow the voices of our USD students and parents. We live, work, play, and worship here in um, the city of Riverside. Our children are products of public school education at RUSD and currently attend our local schools. No one should have the power to oppress another group or to deny access to a complete educational curriculum. Um, the diversity of our RUSD students should be exposed to a well-rounded education that supports a mindset of equity and inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sandy R, followed by Delnita Brown, followed by Letitia Pepper. Welcome, Ms. R, you have three minutes. Thank you, and I'll add athletic experiences also. They should be free of discrimination during athletic experiences. So um, I wanted, the kids normally don't like me to come talk at school board meetings, they cringe, but I wanted to share with you the new milk. So this might not be something you haven't seen lately. The kids are all fascinated by it. I guess some schools have had it for a while. It's new to their school. There's no cup, there's no straw. You just get a bag. There's no tear, there's no sprout. So I don't know if you guys know how to drink this milk, but it's not a hit. So they wanna know when the old milk's coming back. Um, next thing, I wanted to follow up. Two meetings ago, I put some items on the agenda, parental notification and school safety, and the dialogue was shut down, and Mr. Farouk, you stated someone would follow up with me, but that was two meetings ago, so that's basically six weeks ago, and I have not had anyone follow up with me regarding my agenda items. So I don't know if it's going to be you, is it going to be the superintendent, is it going to be assigned to someone? No one has followed up. Um, LCAP parent advisory, still lacking parents. Um, you're supposed to have, you have 40,000 students and you claim to have like 20 something parents on this parent advisory. I join the Zoom every week and the majority of the Zoom is staff or people listening in. Where are the parents? You gotta get the parents. If, if it's the noon time that's affecting you not getting parents, then maybe change the meeting times, but you need to get parents. 
Um, I was at a meeting this last weekend, um, or two weekends ago, with Sabrina Cervantes, and she's on the education committee, and I was discussing our LCAP, and that that's one of my concerns that I've had, and I've told her that I had already escalated that concern to the state, because I feel that your LCAP is lacking parent advisory. You know, you, you need to hear the parents' voices, so I, I think you need to do a better job with parent engagement. Um, and again, advertising it. You don't advertise the LCAP parent advisory meetings. It's open to the public. Anybody can attend, whether you're on the committee or not. The same thing with your school sites. You never advertise the school sites. And those are meetings where, unlike the state of the district where you just sit and listen, these meetings are where you can actually provide public comment. You can provide input. And that's where you need to hear parents' voices. So the last thing I wanted to talk about, because I saw someone post in my community about a ASB club fundraiser, and one of the issues that with that is I want to, I know I talked about boosters before, so now I want to talk about ASB clubs and how ASB clubs are supposed to work. They're student clubs, student fundraising, and student-led. Fundraising should benefit all students. ASB and booster funds should never be commingled, and ASB funds should never be allocated to any particular student. All of those things were happening. So again, when you're, when you're posting an ASB club fundraiser and they're posting in the community and it's for a specific student, that's not what ASB clubs are supposed to be. And I asked my kids, have you ever heard of a ASB football club? And they said, never heard of an ASB football club. Thank you. Thank you. And I ask our staff to please uh, follow up on the, uh, on the matter that she raised. Thank you. Uh, our next speakers are Donita Brown, followed by Letitia Pepper. Welcome, Ms. Brown. You have three minutes. Good evening, everyone. I want to start off by saying someone asked me what would keep me motivated to come and be Arlington High School football booster president. And I said, it doesn't matter if my nephew is at that school or not. I'm still going to do the same work. I've been doing this for 20 years in Riverside. But I want to read something to you dated November 14, 2023. Dear Arlington High School Football Booster parents, as the president of Arlington High School Football Booster, I am happy to give, give this update our booster status along with some background. Our booster is a charity with significant financial responsibilities. As such, it must be registered with the California Attorney General's Office and have an EIN identification number from the IRS. It must comply with national, state, and local rules applicable to how such boosters are run and must file financial reports annually with California Attorney General, the IRS, and RUSD. Thus, your booster needs records of how and how much funds are raised and how on what the funds are spent. On a positive note, your booster is an excellent, fi is an excellent financial help, thanks to the hard work of our wonderful volunteers. But if booster financial health is good, why have parents had to provide the pregame meals this season, normally paid for by booster, that only happened because your booster was incorrectly order to stop operation by our principal. Because your booster's main concern is the well-being of the football team, we retain the services of an experienced attorney who agreed to help, for, help us for free. Our attorney advised us that because the booster was prevented by actions of district employees from being able to complete an audit, we have the right to continue to operate as a booster in order to complete such audit and a legal duty to use those funds already raised for the purposes promised to you, our booster members. Booster will be paying for the banquet and other items for the football team using the funds in our bank account and will make things right for those improperly deprived of booster benefits. Our goal as always is to ensure the football team is provided for. We look forward to giving you an update as additional information becomes available. The reason why I'm saying this is because I came and I asked for help back in July. I came because I didn't know what to do. I was told that the school can help me, so I came to the district. If I'm dealing with an employee that's from the district, I came for help. And you know what happened? We got retaliated, we got shamed, we got set down, and that's not fair to me because I gave my time. I'm a volunteer. But do you know how much stress I have carried on my back and the others, my treasure and everybody else, because we didn't get that help that was said that we were going to get? Thank you, Ms. Brown. We'll have our administration follow up with you. 
Our final public comment is from Letitia Pepper. Welcome, Ms. Pepper, you have three minutes. Good evening. I am the free attorney who wrote that 13-page long letter, single-spaced, to you guys about what's been going on at Arlington High School and here in the district offices, too. In 2016, I was coming to meetings here regularly because the school board, the board of trustees, with the help of insiders in staff, were stealing the Measure O money that had been designed and voted for by the parents to be used for existing schools. And instead, the board, which included Mr. Farouk and Mr. Lee and Mr. Hunt, who are not here tonight, all of you guys were involved in that theft that was set up well in advance. And the theft continues. And so years later, between 2016 and 2023, what do I find? It's true what they say that when there's corruption, it spreads. It spreads from the top down, and that's what's been going on here. So the level of corruption at a place like Arlington High School, where well-paid staff members, district employees, are stealing from parents and kids is shameful. It's shameful. And the fact that you, the superintendent, did not help these people, and instead they were invited to come and talk to you to remedy the problem. I know what was going to happen. That's why I said, let me represent you. And that's why you got a letter from me saying they will not be coming to talk to you. And they will not to talk to anybody in Arlington High School without an attorney with them. Because I know what happened the last time a volunteer group that I knew about spoke to the superintendent and to Mr. Lee. The Reef Board, the volunteers who were raising money for the Riverside Educational Enhancement Foundation, the district made them sign an MOU that basically turned over their fundraising proceeds to the district instead of it staying in the hands of the charity. Totally illegal. And so when I sent a letter about that to you guys on the board, I said, if that MOU is not rescinded, before the next board meeting, I'm going to make a report to the Attorney General. And two days later, the MOU was rescinded. That's a level of corruption going on here where the district superintendent and the trustee were stealing money like that. So I should have sent a letter to the Attorney General. I didn't. I warned I would, and the MOU was rescinded, and I didn't. But guess what? I am sending a letter to the Attorney General about what's been going on in Arlington with help, I'm sure, in other places, because why is a coach who's been stealing the money, why is it that he's now making over $100,000 a year for two years without a teaching credential? How does that happen? How did he get hired here in the first place? It's the same way it happens in other places. The crooks hire each other. They know each other and they help each other. Shameful. Sure. That concludes uh, public input. It will now turn to board member comments, and we'll start with our newest student, student board member, Bibi Naz Nami. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bibi Naz Nami. For the next three months, I will be representing North High School up on the dais. I would like to say that it's a great honor to serve on this board and to be able to act as a voice for the over 40,000 students in our RUSD community. I would like to say that I, in my experience, I've been lucky enough to experience an RUSD where students are empowered through the promotion of equity and inclusive practices, which I think was made clear here at tonight's board meeting through some of the measures taken by students on campus at their very own high schools, whether that be providing college and, college and career opportunities for all, or celebrating student achievement with ice cream sundaes, I think that these are small strides in creating a greater future where students not only feel that their voice is appreciated, but they feel that they are empowered to share their voice. So I would just like to give a thanks to RUSD for creating that environment and cultivating the culture that we now have. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your first report with us. We'll turn now to Trustee Lee. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. I'll keep it brief. Welcome, Bibi Nawaz. We're gr grateful to have you, and uh, congratulations on your recognition by uh, Riverside County as being the Poet Laureate. That's pretty amazing. Um, I hope that you can share that poem with us at a future meeting. 
Um, also want to give my congratulations to, to all the fall uh, athletic teams, uh, regardless of how they finished the year, and uh, special congratulations to the teams that are, are still competing. Um, and I uh, want to thank the staff and the community for putting together a great groundbreaking ceremony at Casablanca Elementary School this morning. I thought that was really well done. Um, and I thought it was really special to um, try to ch change tradition and allow uh, CAG to be the first to put the shovel in the ground at that site. I thought that was a nice touch and I'm glad that they were able to do that. And then last uh, but not least, want to wish everybody a uh, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, I know I'm grateful to be in this district. I'm grateful my kids can go to this district. Uh, and I wish everybody a, a safe and, and healthy Thanksgiving holiday break. Thank you, Trustee Lee. Trustee Kinnear. Thanks, Dr. Farouk. Uh, I, too, wish our, uh, our teams and, and, uh, and bands uh, who are competing this weekend uh, good luck in, uh, in their endeavors. I never quite understood uh, why band directors and coaches and, and other staff members uh, get so excited about working during Thanksgiving vacation. Uh, but it's a, it's a dream for, uh, for coaches and for band directors uh, to be in the, the middle of those competitions at, uh, at th this time of the year. And thanks to all the, the volunteer teachers and, and classified employees who help out with those competitions uh, during vacation. Uh, it really takes uh, a lot of effort and, and work uh, to put a home football game on uh, like Polly is doing uh, tomorrow night uh, at uh, the MLK Stadium. Uh, and uh, the, the number of volunteers working those events are in, incredible, so, so thanks. Uh, I too want to extend uh, my best wishes for uh, a, a wonderful Thanksgiving and uh, Thanksgiving holiday and, and vacation for, uh, for all of our employees and students and, and, uh, and, and parents too. Uh, Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday of all time. I love to eat, and it's a great, great holiday where, uh, where I can enjoy the, the eating and being with family members and people I care about, uh, not giving gifts like we do at some other holidays, uh, and the, the fact that we can just sit back and, and, uh, and think uh, about all the things that, uh, that we appreciate uh, makes for, uh, for just a, a wonderful holiday. So uh, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Trustee Kinnear. Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. Thank you. Uh, so today I had the privilege uh, to address the girls at Ignite Her Mind STEM Symposium. This was a day of STEM and sisterhood. We had over, in attendance over 200 sophomore girls from across all of the high schools at RUSD. They got to hear from Sylvia Acevedo, a former uh, NASA engineer, um, an executive and former CEO of Girl Scouts of America. The girls also were able to engage in different STEM-based uh, breakout sessions with STEM partners uh, within the community and also hear from their, uh, learn from their own RUSD uh, secondary math and innovation departments um, and teachers. They learned about mathematical pattern, patterning, um, computational thinking, coding, and robotics, among other things. Ignite Her Mind uh, exists as a result of our LCAP priorities, which decided to invest in to help to close the gender gap in STEM fields in order to capture girls who may not have self-selected a STEM field, but provide them an opportunity and exposure to, um, to STEM and have an experience in uh, hands-on STEM. So I wanna thank all of the teachers and the chaperones that uh, invested in girls today, uh, teachers and staff that led the breakout sessions, our math and innovation department, and a special thanks to Christina Cardino and her team uh, for all of their uh, tireless work. The uh, girls left both ignited and empowered. Um, also today, uh, we had a, his a historic day. We broke ground at Casablanca Elementary School. I just want to say, el pueblo de Casablanca tendrá una escuela si se pudo. And I wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez Alexander. Uh, you know, I just want to echo sentiments of my colleagues uh, regarding the, the state of the district effort. I really appreciate all of the partnerships that we promoted as well as that we uh, solicited to expand uh, at the event and the, the great dedication of our staff. 
the Casablanca groundbreaking was a very uh, special historic moment for all, all of us and it's really uh, just a, a great testament to the community and the generations uh, that have preceded them and the current leaders uh, to getting uh, us to this point. And so, uh, you know, just very uh, appreciative of all the great efforts there. And uh, I also just want to uh, echo uh, the sentiments regarding uh, wishing everyone a happy Thanksgiving uh, to all of our, our family, students, staff, uh, everybody. Um, it it's really is a blessing, as uh, Trustee Lee mentioned, to be a part of this great district, both as a parent and as a board member. So we'll now proceed to the consent calendar, which are all items listed considered to be routine and will be enacted by the board in one motion. There will be no discussion on these items prior to the board vote unless members of the board request to have specific items removed from the consent calendar. Uh, uh, Dr. Hernandez-Alexander, do we have any public input on this? Okay, we'll start with Jason Hunter followed by Sandy R. It's the consent. Well, welcome, Mr. Hunter, you have three I, minutes. I'm, I'm commenting on, I don't know, is there just one opportunity on consent these days, or can you comment on multiple things on consent? I'm commenting on the policies that are being, I think it's in number two. So we we take consent under one one motion. So you, you talk about ten different things under one one public comment these days. Yes. Okay. So, anyway, so I, my comment will be brief. I've got two minutes and thirty seconds, plenty of time. So there's two things on the policies. Can you please put it to three minutes? I don't need the three minutes. But the, well, the, I would do it as a courtesy thing. Thank you. The um, two policies in particular. Uh, one of them we've discussed several times. And the board has kept saying, don't do that. And it keeps coming back. I don't know whether it's by staff who's throwing it back on there, if there's somebody on the board who keeps throwing it back on there, but it limits public comment. And I have a real problem with that. It's, it's bylaw 9323. Actually, it's uh, 9321, and it says, however, the agenda not need to provide an opportunity for public comment when the agenda item has previously been considered at an open meeting by a committee comprised exclusively of board members, provided that members of the public were afforded an opportunity to comment on the item before or during the committee's consideration of the item, and the item has not been substantially changed since the committee considered it. Well, we have our committee meetings in the middle of the day. People can't make those meetings, and then you're saying you're going to deny them public comment when it comes before the full board? That's wrong. And we've turned that down several times here. I know Mr. Hunt was stridently against that being put into the, the policy, and it needs to be struck down again today. And I feel like you guys, somebody here keeps trying to sneak it in on the public. And I don't want to come down here and keep, you know, I, oh, wow, look at surprise, it's on there again, and have to keep on coming down here and say, don't do that. Don't limit the, public's, the public comment and discussion. What are you afraid of? Are you afraid of the public? Right? So you want to have a meeting, your committee meeting at 1 o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon, nobody can make it, and then just pass it on consent with no opportunity to provide comment from the general public who work for a living or are doing things during the day? That's wrong. What's wrong with you people? And why does it keep coming back? Okay, that's number one. And it's like the third time I've had to speak about this. It's been struck down the previous two times. Strike it down again. The second thing is on bylaw 9323. It's uh, the part where it says the board does not permit audio, audio, visual, or visual digital presentations, such as through PowerPoint and similar presentations, software during public comment or when speaking to items placed on the agenda by members of the public, uh, unless necessary, blah, 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 so on and so forth. Once again, who's putting this malarkey in your policies? We should have an overhead projector here. I take an overhead projector. I would take 1970s technology if I could so I could actually list or put up documents for the public and the board members to see. But for some reason, you're saying we can't use that. Somebody can't come up here with an audio tape and play it if it's, if it's relevant to something that the, the school district has uh, jurisdiction over. Why do, you, why do people here feel like you want to restrain and, and censor the public from providing this board with information? We should have be able to play, you know, for our three minutes, put up the audios and videos and whatever. If staff can do it and they're the employees, we're the goddamn owners. We should be able to do it. We should have at least similar rights, if not more. You're our board of directors, staff are the employees, and the general public are the owners. And, and you need to start treating us like the owners around here. So, so strike that as well and get us some goddamn audio visual. 
Thank you. Thank you. Our, our last public comment on this item is from Sandy R. Welcome, Ms. R. You have three minutes. I can't believe I missed those. Um, yeah, the, when, I, when the attorney said I couldn't play my audio recording during the meeting, I said, show me the policy, show me the law. And he said, well, you have to prove to me that you have the right to play it. In what world does that work that way? If you're telling me I can't do it, the onus of proof is on you. And your attorney or your district was unable to provide and tell me why I could not play the recording. I should have been able to play the recording. It was relevant. It was relevant to what I was talking about, and it was relevant to this district. So that should have been played. Um, the other policy I wanted to talk about is where you want to lump all the parental notifications at the beginning of the year. Do you know as a parent, I don't know, I mean, I'm sure Dr. Noemi and Brentley um, can relate because they have kids in school. And so you, at the beginning of the year, you get this big packet, and you got to sign everything. Just sign here, sign here, so that you can get the kid you know, registered, and you can go get their schedule. And now you want to throw in more stuff in there and just send everything there. I've already had issues before where you're not sending notifications about the sex ed. You're not sending notifications for the surveys, for opt-out. Parents have a right to do that. And if you're just going to bombard them with more stuff at the beginning and say that that's going to, you know, that we met, we met our requirement. We sent it to you at the beginning of the year. That's not okay. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about was the 5% increase for raises that you put the new salary schedule. So I didn't get to stay for the last meeting. So one of the things I think is the public needs to know this isn't just, oh, they got a 5% increase because that sounds reasonable. But this is a 5% increase on top of the 9.75, I think it was, over two years already. So if you add that all together, we're talking that's a very nice increase compared to what the general public normally gets in terms of increases. So, and again, I've said before, your raises are always done based on equality and not equity. So your lowest paid teachers aren't as impacted by this small percentage raise, whereas your higher paid cabinet and superintendent and, and your higher paid teachers, they get a nice raise and it's a, across the board. So why these raises are never done based on equity Instead of equality, you know, you guys keep espousing that you're all about equity, but yet when it comes to your money, you guys are not about equity. So I think the public would like to know, put your money where your mouth is. Okay, that concludes our uh, public input. Uh, and uh, Trustee Kinnear, do you want to pull any uh, an agenda item? Yeah, I'd like to, to, uh, to pull consent agenda items uh, that relate to board policy, uh, specifically 9321 and 9323. Can you please uh, reference the specific agenda item? Number two. Okay. Oh, number, number two? Consent. Consent number two. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and I'll turn a, a, a consideration for BB Nas. If you would like to consider making a motion, you don't ha have to, but if, if you want to consider that, we just wanted to give you the courtesy. I would like to make the motion. So I would like to make a motion to approve consent calendar, calendar items I1 through I12 and omit item I13. As well as number two uh, oh. by Trustee Kinnear's request. Yes. I would also like to omit number two as per Mr. Kinnear's request. Perfect. Do we have a second? Second. Second, uh, Trustee Lee. Please vote. Okay. The motion carries uh, uh, unanimously with Trustee Hunt uh, not being present. So, uh, Trustee Kinnear, uh, if you would like to elaborate on your pulling the item. Thanks. In, uh, in 9323 board policy, uh, it encourages members of the public to directly address the board orally during public comment. Uh, and then it goes on further to say that uh, the board does not permit audio, audio, visual, visual, digital presentations, et cetera, et cetera, such as, as, uh, as PowerPoint. I'm interested in, in hearing wh why this revision is important to us. What's, what's the rationale uh, behind that revision? Uh, in all of our presentations, uh, we use uh, those methods of communication and it makes uh, our communication even more effective. Uh, we're now saying 
that we won't permit uh, uh, the public to use those, and I don't understand the rationale. So if my colleagues could help me with, with uh, why that rationale is important to us, uh, I'd like to, to hear your thoughts. What's the administration's response? Um, when we had a meeting a little while ago um, that one of the speakers referred to, Mr. Kinnear, and it was stated that where is it in the policy, we had a discussion about suggesting some change to the policy. So that's a staff suggested revision at board request. Do, uh, do my colleagues have have reasons as to why we should justify uh, uh, not allowing the public to use uh, any kind of audiovisual or visual digital presentations uh, in their public comment? Because I don't, I don't see it, uh, and I, I don't see the rationale. I, I don't understand it. Uh, so uh, if uh, if if we think it's important. I'd like to know why. Maybe I should change my opinion. Okay. Dr. Hernandez Alexander. I, I just want to enter into a dialogue. I, I'm curious of that too. Um, the only thing I can think of is, is if there's any, because we are live, if there's any obscene or anything that's inappropriate that we don't know that's going to happen, what's going to be said, I mean, that already does happen. Uh, is is what would be another an additional concern? Um, would we be open to uh, providing something like that, but being able to, you know, receive it ahead of time or uh, or do something like that, so we would avoid that the imagery of what could potentially go on live? I mean, I'm just kind of throwing it out there. I I, I know, yeah. please. I, I tell me if it's I, possible. I personally, I can see, I see that, but but you can come up to the mic and basically say right. what you want to say. I mean, I uh, I'm disappointed that uh, that our uh, public speaker uses profanity. That bothers me. Uh, it bothers me that we would we don't allow it with students and in school and in classrooms. And so uh, I don't I don't like it. Uh, but uh, that doesn't. Uh, I don't think it gives me the right to to cut off the mic, and uh, and I don't think it, it's a reason for me not to allow uh, the public to to, to use uh, AV uh, materials to to support their uh, their comments. Uh, so, I think it's a good educational practice uh, to 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 use to use those uh, audiovisual materials. So I would like some historical context. I'm new. Uh, is how, what is the 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 background of why we do or don't allow AV material or audio or anything like that? What, has it been misused in the past? Did we have it and it went away, or we've never had it? It's not. It's never been a. So far. So far as I know, Dr. Hernandez Alexander, just it, it, it has been done by practice. And practice. as we know from here, it hadn't been in policy. So have, making a suggestion to put something in policy allows the discussion for whether it should be or not or how it should be. Sure. Um, I've got a, a question to comment. I mean, since I've been on the board, the first time anybody has asked to do any audio or visual was at that meeting where they had the cell phone recording. So. I haven't seen a strong desire that that's been a practice where that that has been part of the public process. Um, so, so this is that was the first time, and I, I, I can see why we do want to address it one way or the other. Um, the other thing I was thinking, at least in terms of items that are not on the agenda, it's not like we can respond anyways. If it was supporting something on the agenda, I, c I could see it making sense, but it's something not on the agenda. Um, I could see why it could be. Uh, a concern because we can't talk about it anyways and depending on what the person chose uh, whether appropriate or inappropriate I don't think it matters um, it's like we can comment so we can't do anything about it um, and then my my uh, last question my, my question is 
uh, and, I, and I don't have a strong feeling one way or the other, but my, my question is, in the construction of this uh, change, was it modeled after other districts? Do other districts have a similar policy? Does CSBA weigh in on this? Does the county have any response to this? Uh, I didn't do a comparison. If you want to hold it to have a comparison, we can do, the staff can do that. I mean, if, uh, I mean, why don't we just table this policy until we get more answers? That'd be my, my, my recommendation. So I, I just want to add one th thing to that, but I, I'm supportive of that also. Uh, I, I think the most, the most critical aspect of this is, you know, because as Trustee Kinnear mentioned, the free speech implications, it, it, what's, the, what's the legal basis, right? The, the, I think that's the most fundamental question. And so um, do, we, do, we have a, do we have an answer for that? Okay, so I mean, at a minimum, we should table it, but if there's not an answer to that, it probably shouldn't even go back on the agenda because otherwise, you know, it's if if it's being driven by from a legal basis, then that's a different story. If there's precedence and there's a, a, a but otherwise, um, is that is that a, a direction we can give, or it has to go go back either way if we table it? You can give whatever direction you like. <laughs> okay. Uh, do we need to give a, f a formal motion, or that's just a uh, direction we can give you? Okay, um, but we have to vote on the table then, right? No. Okay. No. So we'll table it then. Just that, this that policy. Right, but I, again, we 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 want to. I think the legal aspect is the most important aspect from a First Amendment perspective. So so we'll t table that. Um, that's not. Uh, and then was there another? Yeah, aspect? there there uh, the other one was was the. Uh, uh, limiting public uh, comment if a, if a board subcommittee has uh, dealt with a topic. We already have a board policy that, that says if the board chooses, uh, we can limit public input at a board meeting uh, if the full board has uh, discussed the, the topic. Uh, do we really need that board policy for board subcommittees? Uh, board subcommittees, uh, I mean, very rarely does the public come to a, a, a board subcommittee when we, when we have them, and we have very few of them, uh, but very rarely do they come. Uh, board subcommittees aren't televised. Uh, people don't have access to, to, uh, to board subcommittee meetings like they have access to our full board meetings. Do we really need to have that policy, uh, or is, is that... Uh, uh, limiting uh, public input to a degree that uh, that, that we shouldn't. Uh, yeah. uh, Can I you point me to what, what, what you're referring to, Mr. Kinnear? Yeah, I want to read it too. Yeah. I, I bylaw don't. number what? You Pardon don't me? Which, you don't know which bylaw it is? Uh, it's, I believe it's 9321. 9321 is I don't have it in front of me. I just have my notes. I'm very, very... Yeah, it's not, I don't see it on there. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I have my notes. I don't have. I, I, I didn't bring. Twenty-two, ninety-three, twenty-two. Try that one. It's in red on 9322, if that's the right number. And, and basically it says that if a, a board subcommittee uh, has dealt with the topic, uh, then uh, we don't uh, need to allow the public to weigh in on that topic. At a, at, a, at a board meeting. So that one was, that was based on a C, this one was based on a CSBA model. Is it the same policy we just talked about? No, that, the one we just talked about was 9323. And the one that Mr. Kinnear is referring to now is 9322.
So what so we, we could do is pull it, and then you can see the, the CSBA recommendation side by side, and then I'm com I'm comfortable with that. So this one is a as a model standard model best model practice model. from the state. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so we'll we'll pull that one just so that we can contrast it and understand how much it aligns with what the state. Yeah. Is. Okay. Yeah. And and again, my my uh, uh, my opinion is based on the on the fact that that uh, that our subcommittee meetings when we have them uh, they're they're uh, they're not online for uh, for people to to view the meeting remotely they have to go to the meeting they're they're not very well attended uh, oftentimes we have no one at a subcommittee meeting or or maybe one person or, or two people uh, so uh, I th I think that to, uh, to have that uh, a public comment in front of the full board about a subcommittee item it makes it just makes sense to me. Okay, uh, Trustee Lee. Uh, yeah, I'd like to make a motion to approve consent item number two, with the modification to pull board bylaw ninety three twenty two and board bylaw ninety three twenty three. Before we do that, did you have a question, or you were just going to make a motion also? No, I just wanted to continue the discussion, um, Trustee Canero. So what I'm hearing you say is that anything that's decided in subcommittee doesn't really have a, a practical opportunity for public input. So really the only opportunity for public input would be the full board meeting. Yes, thank you, and you, you said it well. I apologize for not being able to say no, it No, so well. I'm, I'm not trying to overstate it. I, I don't hope I didn't come off that no, way. I was just trying well. to understand it. You said it well. So yeah, yeah, I, I agree with polling, and I, and I second Mr. Lee's motion. OK, so in addition to the contrasting the, the, the state best practices, having some context on the rationale on why they justify having that practice in the first place, it might be helpful for us to have that context. From the CSBA yeah, model? Exactly. Okay. Um, so the, there's been a motion and a second. Uh, we please vote. Okay, the motion carries uh, unanimously. Uh, so now uh, we'll turn to our action items, which is a recommendation for the board to approve resolution number 2023-2024-40 to adopt the amended conflict of interest code pursuant to Political Reform Act of 1974. Uh, uh, did you, did you, uh, you uh, Trustee Lee, when you made the motion, did you include 13 also? Okay. Thank you for catching that. Okay, uh, if we can entertain a motion on 13. Second. Mo motion by Trustee Lee, seconded by Trustee Kinnear. Please vote. Thank you, Beth, for catching that. Okay, so uh, Superintendent Hill, please lead us in this uh, first action item. Yes, the code of uh, in the conflict of interest code uh, is a document that we have to file regularly and it has to be updated when staff members are added or titles are changed. So this includes the addition of Mr. Williams and Mr. Preecy and a title change for Mr. Sewell. All right, thank you, Superintendent Hill. Uh, do, Dr. Hernandez-Alexander, do we have any public input on this item? No, we do not. Okay, if anybody has any comments or questions or we can entertain a motion. Move to approve. Motion by Trustee Kinnear. Seconded by Trustee Lee. Please vote. Okay. Motion carries unanimously. Our next two agenda items are related to new board policies, and uh, Deputy Superintendent Mr. Walker will lead us through them. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Verk. Superintendent Hill, members of the board. <clears throat> Tonight is the first read of uh, new board policy 5141.5, uh, addressing the issue of mental health. This is a new policy that brings RUSD in alignment with the requirements of the state. This policy aligns with our wellness priority and aligns with RUSD providing physical and mental health services. Yes, I should move this along. Some key points of the policy include reducing the stigma surrounding mental health and ensuring access to mental health services. Also includes staff trainings to identify the signs and symptomology of mental health and behavioral health issues. 
requires an integrated plan to support mental health, and it also requires preventative strategies, connecting students to school, creating a support network, and also techniques for conflict resolution. Uh, before we hear from the public, com uh, any public comments, I want to uh, first recognize and s extend my appreciation once again to the Board of Education for the proactive efforts that were taken uh, close to nine years ago to come into um, the creation of a wellness program here in the Riverside Unified School District, one of the first in the state of California that has been uh, replicated uh, across the whole state. Um, your efforts are, have done wonders for our school district and for our children that attend uh, our USD. Um, after the public comments, if you have any questions, both uh, uh, Director Katerina Schantz and myself be happy to answer any questions. You're free to take action this evening, even though it is a first read. Thank you, Mr. Walker. We have one public comment from Sandy R. Welcome, Ms. R. You have three minutes. So um, before I start on this topic, I just want to say, since the comments was made that I use profanity, the times that I have used profanity at this board meeting was, and I'm going to talk about this topic of mental health, was when I was reading material that you gave to students, that's where the profanity came from, and when I was quoting what a coach told this my is son not specifically. To this item. Again, I'm just addressing that item. It affected my mental health, it affected our mental health, it affected a lot of kids' mental health. So, anyways, with regards to this topic, so if you don't want profanity, don't give that material to my kid and don't say it to my kid because I will repeat it. Um, the issue with the mental health centers is I came to you about a year ago when you started building these wellness centers at the high schools and I said, why are you building all these wellness centers? You know, the kids can't consent to them. You know, why are you building them at every high school? Why are you texting the kids? Come check out the new wellness center. Well, of course, the law got passed. Wouldn't you know it? The law got passed and now 12 year olds can consent to mental health independently. So parent consent is not needed. So it's almost like you guys were like prepared for this law to come into effect. So again, I think it's one thing that you have these centers, but I don't think that you should be reaching out to the students, encouraging them to come. If they want to come, if they want to seek out the services, they'll seek them out. You don't need to be texting students. You don't need to be encouraging them to visit. The wellness center isn't a hangout. You don't need to you know, make it like a hangout for the kids so that you can bring them into that system. Uh, there's a lot of parents that have a problem, and if you don't think that parents have a problem with this push towards the kids, then just look at your the amount of parents that are pulling their kids out of schools. There are parents pulling their kids out of schools. That's why you went to Universal TK, because you were your numbers were down, and they're going to keep going down if you do this. So it's fine that you want to offer these services, but you don't need to actively pursue the students to use them. And I'd love to see some utilization numbers. How many kids are actually going to these wellness centers? Does it justify all the counselors and psychologists? that you hired. I sent Mr. Kinnear a salary analysis and I was surprised how many um, psychologists you have in the district. Very shocking. So I, I probably will request some utilization numbers. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our public comments. I'll turn to my colleagues if there's any comments or questions or we can entertain a motion. Our student board member. I would like to say that at the high school level, I feel that the wellness centers have proven as a equitable resource for mental health for many students. I know many students at my school personally who have benefited from the use of the wellness centers and especially at a Title I school like North, many of these students may have otherwise not had access to these facilities had it not been for the school site providing them. So. That's been my experience with the wellness centers. Thank you for sharing that student perspective, very important perspective. Any other comments or questions or a motion from the, my colleagues? If there's no further comment from the board, I'll make a motion to approve the policy. Trustee Kinnear, did you want, have something? Or you, no, I'll okay. second the motion. Motion by Trustee Lee, seconded by uh, Trustee Kinnear. So this is adopted in, in the first read then, is, just so we're all clear then. Correct, Trustee Lee, with your motion? Okay, all right. Please vote. Okay, the motion carries. 
Our next agenda item is another new board policy being presented as a first reading, uh, and Deputy Superintendent Walker will walk us through it. Yes, again, uh, good evening, Dr. Farouk, Superintendent Hill, members of the board. This is a second new board policy that's coming your way for consideration this evening in the area of health services, board policy 5141.6. This board policy is in, aligns with our priorities and the access to both uh, physical and mental health services. Some key points in this policy include access to the health services for all students, addressing the student's physical, mental, and behavioral health needs, including health education, nutrition, and physical fitness, providing uh, health care professionals Healthcare professionals um, entering into partnerships in the area and including nurses in the planning and the provision of school health services after the um, public has an opportunity to give any comments they may want to uh, share. Uh, you're free to take action this evening, even though it is a uh, first read on this board policy. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Walker. Dr. Hernandez Alexander, do we have any public input on this item? No, we do not. Okay. Does anybody have any comments or questions? I'll make a motion to approve. Wait. Were you going to make a motion? Okay. Can we entertain her question? Sorry. Dr. Hernandez Alexander? Yes, Mr. Walker, can you uh, explain to us a little bit of what the uh, physical um, help, the physical part of the services are offered for students? Um, I actually have our lead nurse here this evening who can provide you with a comprehensive uh, overview okay. of that particular question as well as our partnerships. That's great. Thank you. Uh, please welcome uh, John Davis, our lead nurse for the Riverside Unified School District. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Davis. Good evening. Um, so your question was uh, a little bit of clarity on the physical aspect. So. Um, as far as what happens during the school day, um, the um, district provides vision and hearing screening uh, for grades K to five uh, and eight. Every year those are mandated screenings. Um, that's pretty much the extent of like a physical examination that occurs at a school site. Um, outside of school, if students are uninsured, we have lots of partnerships with um, Nonprofit organizations, one in particular is part Project KIND. Uh, KIND stands for Kids in Need of Doctors. So um, we were able to connect students without insurance to um, a doctor, a dentist, an eye doctor, um, so that they get the services that they need. Um, we have our health center at the Central Registration Center. We do physical exams for kids that don't have uh, health insurance through the CHDP program, um, which stands for Child Health and Disability Prevention. And that um, provides Medi-Cal for two months for the student in case we find something during the physical that they need follow-up for. They can get it right away. Uh, we also do immunizations. Um, students are required to have immunizations to enroll in school. So we provide those for free through the Vaccines for Children program, which is a federal, uh, fairly funded program that RUSD um, utilizes. Um, so, so those are some of the, the physical aspects. And just so we know, um, when you say we're covering a student, you're providing the service to the family, is that correct? So, um, yeah, so for, as far as the physical exam goes, uh, kindergarten, preschool, first grade, and um, for sports, they're required to have a physical. Um, so students who are uninsured, um, a lot of times have difficulty accessing those services, so that's why we provide them for free through the district. Um, this CHDP program is a state-funded program, and that is uh, what, um, what's able to uh, give the student Medi-Cal immediately for the mm -hmm. next two months so that they can follow up if they need any further services. Okay, so then it just covers the student. Yeah, exactly, right. yep. But the student can't, does, oh. can a student procure any of these services on his or her own? As far as um, if it's an uninsured student, is that what you mean? Like without parental consent? Um, yeah, so yeah, that's the, the law in California. They're, they're able to you know, access health services. We have a list of um, uh, community clinics that they can access services uh, um, if they need it 
Um, so that's what we would provide if, if a student expressed that they don't have insurance, they need, you know, whatever medical services, we give them a list of places they can go to, to access those services. Okay. But if, I, but if I were a family that needed coverage, our family resource centers and like there's um, resources that are available and we educate our families as to where they could get covered, where they could get help. Yeah, that so correct? that's a good point. Family resource center, um, they um, have a person designated to, um, they specialize in helping families access Medi-Cal or apply for Medi-Cal. It's a difficult process a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So um, what the Family Resource Center would do would be to uh, make an appointment with this person and that person can sit down with the family and make sure the application goes through so that the whole family can get Medi-Cal. Yeah, exactly. Great. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for your service. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez Alexander, uh, student board member Nemi. Hi, I was reading the policy and I noticed it said that the nurse shall be involved in planning and implementing the school health services as appropriate. And I was wondering at RUSD, to what extent would the school nurses, the on-site staff be involved in this process? So in, in Riverside Unified, um, we don't have nurses at the schools, we have the health assistants. Um, and then we have um, a, a district nurse assigned to seven, eight, or nine schools. So um, the, the health services department employs 10 school nurses, um, and that's who the district would, um, you know, seek, uh, you know, information from to implement health services. You don't have any further comments? Oh, um, would the responsibility lie on them on implementing the plan, or would they just be consulted by the district? Um, depends. So, yeah, like vision and hearing, those are the school nurses are, are in charge of those. Um, they do a lot of, you know, for students, especially students with like, uh, who are medically fragile, have a lot of medical needs and, and need to attend school. I mean, they might have G-tube feedings or trach uh, suctioning or catheterization. Mm -hmm. um, so it just would depend on, on um, which action, I'm sorry, the, the board is, uh, or the district is taking as to like, would the nurses be the ones implementing those things or not? Mm -hmm. So, this, this is a question for, I guess, the rest of the board. Is that something that is being decided with this meeting, or would that be a later topic of discussion? It would uh, be a later topic of discussion because of the matter at hand right now is just the, the policy, mm -hmm. whether you would like to approve this policy, have the, a policy approved on the first read. You could also have it come back for a second reading. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? We can entertain a motion then. Um, I would like to motion for the approval of policy 5141.6. Motion by a student board member, Nami. We have a second. Second. Second, Trustee Kinnear. Please vote. Okay, the motion carries unanimously. This takes us now to our reports discussion portion. Uh, and our first topic is the Annual English Learner Proficiency Assessment of California, uh, results for 2022-23. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Dan Sosa. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Good evening, Dr. Farouk, Superintendent Hill, board members, community. This evening, we'll be looking at our summative results for our English Learner Proficiency Assessment for California, what we call LPAC, and I'll be inviting Director of Research Assessment and Evaluation, Mr. Sean Curtin, to come up and give the data piece, and then we will hear from Director of Curriculum and Assessment, Ms. Christy Batchelder, to talk to us about the instructional implications. So, Mr. Curtin. So good evening, President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, Board Trustees, and Executive Cabinet. Tonight I'll be sharing with you the 2022-23 Summative English Learner Proficiency Assessment of California, otherwise known as LPAC. The results I will be sharing about were publicly released on October 18th, along with the CAS results that I shared in the last board meeting. 
Supporting English learners is a district priority and is, su is supported through our local control accountability plan in actions 1.4C and 2.1F. The purpose of the report is to inform the Board of Education and our educational partners about the 2022-23 LPAC results and also the RUSD reclassification process. So outcomes will be as follows. Review the characteristics of the English learners in RUSD, understanding the LPAC overall, review the LPAC results, and then review the reclassification criteria and data. This slide is uh, an outline of the presentation that will begin with, like I said, the profile of our English learners and then ending with our instructional response. So who are our English learners in RUSD? I'm going to share some information about our English learners, starting with this first slide that most of our English learners are U.S. born. Here we see that the majority are born in the United States, which makes up about 78.9%. As we look a little deeper about our English learners or where they're born, Guatemala and Mexico are countries we see larger numbers of students coming from. So a majority of our English learners are born locally. This slide shows the U.S. birthplaces of English learners in our USD. 42.5% of our English learners in our USD are, are born right here in Riverside. And 653 born right here in the Inland Empire. Represented there on the left, you can see the other local cities our English learners are born in. Overall, there are 229 cities in the U.S. that ELs and RUSD are um, born in. This slide shows a breakdown of our English learners' home language. 89.9% of our English learners indicate a home language of Spanish. Other home languages that are represented in RUSD are Chinese, Vietnamese, Filipino, Arabic, Pashto, and Russian. This slide shows that we currently have 6,619 English learners, and they are spread out across the following grade spans. In TK2, there are 2,049 English learners, makes up about 31%. In grades 3 through 6, there are 2,126 English learners, about 32%. In middle school, 913, and high school, 1,531, and that's about 23%. This also means that two-thirds of our English learners are at the elementary level. Next, I want to dig into our high school group and give some additional information. So 14% of our high school English learners are newcomers. 58% are long-term English learners, so that's six or more years, and I'll explain that in de more detail later. Approximately 2% are experiencing homelessness. And on average, our high school EOs have been enrolled in the U.S. schools for about six years. Attendance rate is pretty high amongst this group, about over 95%. And an interesting uh, note, 58% of our English learners in high school are male. This slide gives information on the makeup of our English learners group in relation to student programs, which shows the number of them are also represented in other unduplicated categories. Oops, one more. There we go. 4,909 are considered low income, which is 74%, and 605 are experiencing homelessness, which is 9.1% of the total. Also, 1,120 of our English learners are at risk of becoming long-term English learners. So the CDE defines an at-risk of being a long-term English learner as an English learner in grades 3 to 12 who has been enrolled in the U.S. school for four to five years and has scored at a level three on the prior administration of the LPAC. With that, we currently have 929 of our English learners who are classified as long-term English learners. And the CDE defines a long-term English learner as a student in grades 6 through 12 that has been enrolled in the U.S. schools for six or more years and has remained at the same English language proficiency level for two or more consecutive prior years or has regressed to a lower English language proficiency level. Digging a little deeper into our English learners, this slide shows that our current English learners that are classified as newcomers. Newcomers are defined as immigrant, immigrant children and who are aged 3 through 21, are not born in any state, and have not been attending one or more schools in any of one or more states 
for three full um, academic years. So this represents, our, our newcomers represent 12% of our overall English learners. And above, you can see the majority of our newcomers are in grades TK through six, but also a significant number of newcomers in high school at 214. Now we will transition to the RUSD outcomes on the 2022-23 CASP. This next slide is just a visual of our assessment continuum. It is important to show the different types of assessments as each provide information about student progress. Tonight's outcomes fall on the far right of the continuum as we are reporting on the large scale summative assessment, and in this case, it's LPAC. Here, I wanna take a little time to share the English learner journey. When a student enters public school, for the first time, the parent or guardian is given a home language survey up in the left-hand corner. From the survey, if there is a language other than English spoken in the home, this will then trigger the district to schedule an initial LPAC assessment within 30 days of the receipt of the home language survey. The results of the initial LPAC identifies the status level of a learn or English learner and if they're English or fluent English proficient or they're an English learner. Once a student is identified, then they will take the summit of LPAC yearly to monitor and measure progress with English language acquisition and ultimately reclassification. So research indicates that language acquisition proficiency takes a roughly five to seven years. Once a student reclassifies in RUSD, they exit the English language development services, but the district is required to monitor their progress for four years. Here, I want to orient you to the different types of the LPAC assessments. On the left, there is the initial LPAC, which is given to students based on the home language survey that indicates a primary language other than English. In other words, this identifies the English learner. This assessment is only given one time, and it essentially gives a baseline of the student's English language acquisition status. The initial LPAC is used to identify the student as either an English learner or in need support to learn English or as a person who's proficient in English. The initial, the initial alternative LPAC just below that has the same purpose as the initial LPAC, but it is meant for students with the most severe cognitive disabilities and the age range goes through 21 years old. The summative LPAC on the right is used for progress monitoring. The summative LPAC is derived from the California English Language Development Standards or ELD standards and is given to identify English learners K-12 K through 12 annually until they reclassify and are designated reclassified fluent English proficient, which with all of our acronyms, RFEP is how we refer to them. Similarly to the initial alternative LPAC, the summative alternative LPAC has the same purpose and, and it is for students with significant cognitive disabilities along with um, ages that goes through age 21. So the summative LPAC is taken each year starting in February and goes through May. The results on the LPAC are meant to help tell the school or district how student pr is progressing with ling language acquisition and ultimately reclassification. In essence, the summative LPAC is the test which help the teachers gain a better understanding of what type and how much support students need with English as well as to be successful in school. The assessment is broken into four domains. Listening and speaking, which is developed first, in reading and writing, which is later developing. The four domains are co combined into two subtests, oral and written language, and we box those domains to represent each te uh, test, subtest above. The time to test each student varies depending on the grade level, the domain being assessed, and the needs of each student. This slide shows the four performance levels along with the descriptors for the LPAC. So level one, minimally developed, English learners at this level tend to rely on learned words and phrases to communicate meaning in basic, at a basic level. Level two, somewhat developed. English learners at this level can use English to meet immediate communication needs, but often are not able to use English to learn and communicate on topics and content areas. Level three is moderately developed. So English learners at this level can sometimes use English to learn and communicate in meaningful ways in a range of topics and content areas. And then finally, level four, well-developed English learners at this level can use English to learn and communicate in meaningful ways and appropriate to different tasks, purposes, audience, 
and academic contexts. Right here, parents and families are notified yearly of student performance through the student score report. These are available in ARIES and accessed from the parent portal. Note the distinction of oral and written language. The oral language score shows how student is specifically progressing with the domains, listening and speaking. The written language score shows how students is specifically progressing in domains of reading and writing. So now we'll transition to the results on the 22-23 LPAT. We have 6,184 students who took the summative LPAC in the spring of 2022-23. 14 14.2% scored in level four as compared to 11.6 in 21-22. 33.6 scored in level three as compared to 34.2 in 21-22. The district's LCAP goal was to increase the percentage of students in level three and four combined by 4%. We fell short of that goal, but there was 1.7% growth. And 31.4% 31 scored in level two as compared to 33.1 in 21-22 and 20.8 scored in level one as compared to 21.4 and 21-22 as well. So please take a moment to look over the slide and the comparison of the two years. In this slide, we capture the overall results shared in the previous slide with the subtest results, oral and written language. Notice the difference in the two columns with respect to the levels of achievement. With oral language, 65.9% of students are achieving developed or well-developed level three and four compared to 25.3% of the students achieving developed or well-developed in written language. So keep in mind that our level four students who reclassify before the summative LPAC are not included in the scores. And this does impact written language scores to some degree. In regards to written language, I want to commend the board in establishing writing as one of the local board priorities for this year and moving forward. This slide shows the performance of our English learners by grade span starting with TKK on the left and ending with a grade span 9 through 12 on the right. So take a moment to compare the performance by grade span. This slide shows the performance of our English learners by student programs with students with disabilities on the left and moving right, low-income students, followed by students experiencing homelessness or McKinney-Vento, and finally, foster youth. Students with disabilities declined 3.5% as compared to the 21-22 results, while low-income students increased by 2.2%. Students experiencing homelessness increased by 6.7% and foster youth increased by 11.7%. So take a moment to compare by student programs. This slide shows the performance of our English learners on LPAC for four years with 2018-19 on the left and moving right to the last column, our most recent outcomes in 22-23. Looking at four years, we have gradually increased the, in level three and level four performance from 44.9% to 47.8%. Take a moment to review the years. And this slide shows the performance in comparison to the county and state overall results on the recent outcomes in our 22, in 2022-23. Take a moment to compare the performance to the county and the state. There's a 1.1 difference from the county and a 2.5 difference from the state. Now we're going to transition to a discussion of our English learner reclassification and the process. As mentioned before, research tells us that it takes five to seven years to reclassify. In order to reclassify, there are three essential components. A student needs to have an LPAC score of level four and 
academic proficiency of basic skills relative to English proficient students. For example, um, in grades one through three, a fast bridge score at benchmark, benchmark or low risk and a Lexal score range of a fluent reader. Or example, seven, grades seven through 12, an SBAC score in ELA that meets or exceeds the standard or a district writing score of three or four and a Lexal score in the range of a fluent reader. And then there's also the teacher and parent recommendation that goes into making the decision about reclassification. In this slide, I wanna be sure to share the differences in how English progress is measured. In the image above here, you'll see LPAC levels, and you'll see those, that's what we're talking about tonight, levels one, two, three, and four. And then as we're approaching the California dashboard results in December, those are the English learner progress indicator that I'll be reporting on. And it is basically taking the four LPAC levels and breaking it into six parts. This aligns closely to their research of five to seven years and showing the progress of an English learner. So I just wanted to share that as we share the California dashboard results next month. To give a brief update on our progress with reclassification, last year we reclassified 543 students from English learner status to reclassified fluid English proficient students. So far in 2023-24, we have reclassified 214 English learners with many more in progress. With academic proficiency, as the year moves on, we will see more and more reclassifications. This slide shows the reclassification rate in RUSD for the past three years. It is calculated by dividing the number of English learners who reclassify by the total number of English learners in RUSD. So take a moment to review those three years. Okay, now we will transition to the instructional response where I'll invite my colleague, Ms. Christy Batchelder, who is the Director of Curriculum and Assessment and oversees the important work with our English learners. Good evening. Our current instructional work in RUSD reflects a recommitment in supporting everyone in our educational system to more deeply understand how learning experiences for English learners need to be designed. With that being said, an, any effective instructional response is centered first around responding to our English learners' assets and needs. We seek to learn what languages they speak, the cultures they share, the number of years they have been in the country, how many years they have been in RUSD schools, whether or not they have maybe possibly experienced interrupted education. And then we reflect on their English language learning development over the years, along with their current level of language proficiency. To see English learners succeed in reclassification and achieving at high levels, lesson planning includes the strategic selection of supports and strategies for access. In turn, allowing teachers to maintain high quality, rigorous instruction while still supporting language development. Our district has established three clear instructional commitments for English learners. Collaborative conversations, graphic organizers, and sentence frames. These strategies are not just shared through our EL department, but are modeled across all content areas with the goal of bringing continuity to the learning environment. These tools have even been used across divisions in an effort to systematize practice, personnel, wellness and engagement, and others. As has been outlined by our superintendent, the Big Seven provide focus for instruction in RUSD. These instructional focus areas of standards, DOK and rigor, independence, and on-the-spot intervention are even more amplified for our English learners. To effectively support all levels of English learners, designated and integrated ELD must happen daily. In planning for integrated ELD, teachers examine the academic language needed, 
the way a sentence might need to be constructed to demonstrate mastery of standards, and then support students with increased opportunities to practice using that language across all content areas. Designated ELD is equally important for our English language learners. During this part of their day, the ELD standards are at the center of instruction, and dedicated time is spent on language with students interacting, experiencing how language works, and strengthening their foundational reading skills. We know that this kind of strategic planning requires support. In RUSD, various tools, staffing roles and supports, as well as plans for ongoing professional development have been implemented. One specific tool we have guided teachers and admin to better leverage is our elevation software. Beyond use, using this tool for progress monitoring of how our students are performing on assessments, additional features within this software are now available and include strategies of support for integrated ELD in all grades and math language support for secondary math courses. In recognition of the importance of having formative tools available for teachers, RUSD has been administering the Lost Links assessment over the last few years. We are also currently exploring the newly released LPAC interims from the California Department of Education to offer as a replacement to this formative tool for the 24-25 school year. When aligning resources for staffing with the needs of our English learners in mind, we have added new roles and reimagined some of our existing supports. As part of the LCAP additional funding approved last spring, we have designated a coordinator specifically for English learners and started the process of partnering sites with EL TOSAs, Teachers on Special Assignment, as well. In collaboration with their administrators, these TOSAs provide coaching to teachers and reinforce best practices for English learners directly in the classroom. We have started this year with two TOSAs who are partnered at Longfellow and Jefferson and look forward to building out the model across our campuses in the years ahead. Our MTSS liaisons and site administrators also continue to serve as instructional leaders, reinforcing the implementation of key practices. Our RUSD high schools are also provided with an allocation for additional staff for newcomer support and augmented tutoring opportunities continue to be available across all levels. Lastly, at the bottom of the slide, continued professional development is indicated. Shifting instructional practice to consistently identify opportunities for input and output of language is not achieved with a singular PD opportunity. ELD practices are beginning to shift as we provide PD and a trainer of trainers model allow space for teacher support directly in the classroom, and teachers engage in the planning process with the assets and needs of their English learners in mind. This continued partnership to further develop instructional planning connected to ELD standards and language learning opportunities ensures a path forward toward reclassification and standards mastery. Lastly, in addition to their instructional response, increasing language proficiency for all students is strengthened most through a partnership with our community. Instructional services would like to call attention to our new family resource website that offers families a variety of resources to extend support for learning outside of the school day. Each content area offers information and resources to our community in both English and in Spanish and parents can access these resources through our district website or by scanning the QR code you see on the screen above. Thank you, that concludes my share out. Thank you so much for that very comprehensive and, and important discussion. Uh, we'll now turn to Dr. Hernandez Alexander. She has a public comment from Sala Panet. Welcome, Sally. You have th three minutes. Thank you, Superintendent and Board Members. I ha just have a question about page 21 of the LPAC, which is a chart showing oral versus written language proficiency. Uh, when I first looked at it, I was shocked by the disparity 
between the number of students who are in the top two tiers of oral language proficiency uh, versus far fewer students who are in the top two tiers of written language proficiency. And my question is, does this reflect the population at large to a great extent? That, that most people who are even native speakers who are proficient in speaking their language aren't necessarily proficient in writing it. Okay, thank you. That concludes uh, public input. And so we'll start with Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to piggyback on the public comment question. I think that's a really good question. Does it reflect our overall uh, proficiency in writing with our students? It, it does. Um, we, we, we see that writing as an area. It was shared in the last board mm -hmm. meeting that that's an area of focus for us, and the board has made that a priority. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I have another question. Is that okay? Um, <clears throat> And I, I might be missing something, and, and there might be something in the works, but I feel a little bit disconnected between the data and then the, the instructional response. I'd like to heal, hear a little bit more of the nuanced, what we, more analysis. I think I, I, think I keep going back to more analysis is the word. Um, and I don't know if this is something that you're going to be developing as we go, or if there's something that we can talk about here, but I'll just throw an, um, one area of analysis that I'd like to hear more about is, do, we, do you have a suspicion as to why um, some of our EL learners are, st are, in, are st still English learners more than six years? Does it have to do when they started to learn English? Does it have to do with age? Does it like, is there any analysis on that? Well, we, we, in the data, we show that, in, so when we were showing the, the LPAC results, you can see that there's students showing proficiency like TKK. One reason when we look at the LPAC, it's 70% oral, 30% written in the T. In TKK, you'll see in first through third grade, the results are higher as well. As So since the LPAC, when we're talking about the LPAC, it developed, the complexity increases as the years as well. So it's derived from the ELD standards, which are connected to our English language arts standards. And, and so as the test becomes more complex, as kids come into our system. So when we get English learners that are newcomers that come into our system and we see that we have a large number of LTELs, let's say, or long-term English learners in high school or, or newcomers that are into high school, we see them struggle because one, it's the rigors of the academics, that, that technical language, and then also um, learning a, a language acquisition at all at the same time. So do we see that in older students compared to younger students? Is that what, we're, is that what you're saying? Are, with just a regular, are you, are you talking about older and younger with English learners? With or just English early? learners, with English learners. Yeah, so we're seeing, and it depends on when they come into this. So if we're talking about a, a newcomer, it's them trying to come in, they're coming into the system, learning a language along with the content. So as they come into the system, if they're coming in at a higher level, the rigors of school are much more complex. So that is a, a barrier for them. So we do see, and we see that our, with our writing outcomes, um, I mean, we're seeing that with the LPAC. Now, the other thing I want to do point out, that large discrepancy, remember, keep in mind, we do reclassify students. So our students that are reclassifying are writing at that more well-developed area, and they're pulled out of that data. So that does contribute a little bit to the discrepancy. Okay. Okay. And then my last question is, uh, we identified Longfellow and Jefferson to, to provide more resources for. Is there a reason why we, we picked those two schools? Um, Ms. Batchelder. The goal is to extend resources throughout and across, but Longfellow and Jefferson have the most highest number of English learners currently, okay. so that's why we okay. started there. That's where the concentration of English learners are? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you both. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to our student board member, uh, Nami. I might have missed this, but I was wondering if there were any practices or partnerships in place to support our growing numbers 
of non-Spanish-speaking non, of non -Spanish -speaking ELD students. Um, I bring this up specifically because of some of the issues I see on my own campus at North where we've been receiving a large influx of native Pashto, Farsi, and Arabic-speaking students. And I noticed that a lot of our ELD teachers either don't have the resources or support and are struggling to help these new students. Excellent question, thank you. As we work with our teachers across our district, we that's the very intent of us reinforcing and recommitting to our designated and integrated ELD learning. Um, we do have students in our district who are English learners who speak a variety of different languages. So it wouldn't benefit us to just translate in one mm -hmm. language because we have multiple languages to be able to address. And in doing effective instruction for all students, we have to understand language acquisition, provide more structured language experiences for students related to their content, use the commitments that we've established as a district with our graphic organizers, sentence frames, identifying key vocabulary related to lessons to give students access points to the content so that then they can begin to interact with one another. We learn a lot um, about student learning by having students turn to one another and engage in conversation even with simple sentences, hearing from their peers, and being able to replicate um, modeled language as well. So would I be correct in understanding that it's an ongoing process? It is absolutely an ongoing process. There are tools also that we try to partner for newcomer students. Um, for example, Rosetta Stone is a tool that's available for our newcomer students who come into our district and need to just learn communicating, how to communicate with some basic language, how to communicate their needs, wants. Um, so we try and offer a variety of tools to help with that basic first language so they can access navigating school. Do we know how effective the provision of these tools has been so far? We do monitor the provision of those tools and their use. Um, we also look toward other tools and mm -hmm. currently looking at whether or not Rosetta Stone, um, we might benefit from offering an alternative. So yes, we do monitor that regularly. Mm -hmm. And I had a separate question. I was curious as I was listening to um, the presentation with my own experience as someone who went through the DLI program that RUSD provides, I was wondering, is the DLI program a tool that a lot of ELD students use and benefit from? Yes, when we establish our dual language immersion classes, ideally 50% of those students in the class would be English learners. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Lee. All right, um, thank you. I had a few questions for me. When we do these assessments and we come up with these scores, um, what do we do with them? How do we share them with the student, their family, the teachers, counselors? Like, what's the process once the score comes in? So as far as, well, I'll answer first about the um, families. So there's a score report that goes in to the ARIES portal and the families access that. So that notification is done automatically. It's done actually within 30 days after the assessment um, um, concludes in May. So that is right away. They actually get the results before we send out the results. Um, when the information comes in, we, once um, we have that preliminary data, we take that data, we, we create reports, and then those are put in what we call data catalogs. And those are provided to each of our principals, our sites, so that they have access to that data. And then, of course, we get the real data or the, the final released or scrub data, and then we create the reports, and that's um, reported here. And, and we then, if there's any updates that we need to make, we do that for our, our sites. I think I'm more concerned on the, the individualized scores. So um, if I'm a parent of an, uh, an ELD student, the way I'm going to get 
feedback on the assessment of my student is by logging into ARIES? Well, that, that is the official notification as far as teachers and knowing their students, knowing their who, and, and, and taking inventory of all their students, their English learners, and having conversations about the work that they're doing and then their supports as an English learner. That is something that is natural and ongoing. So teachers are using ARIES to check in on student scores. And they have that data as well. It's provided to them. Can we tell if a parent or guardian is logging into ARIES and checking? We can check, we, we know, yeah, there, there's utilization data, yes. Is there, yeah, okay. There is utilization I think data. my concern would be is how do we better involve the families in this process? Um, and if they're even checking, you know, I mean, if, if their student is an English learner, I'd, I'd imagine they're probably, were an English learner, if not are English learners. So do they know how to access? Do they know how to read the data? Um, how do they come along and support their student if, if, if they don't know what they're supposed to do? So a couple things that we do when we first do that, and, and I'll share an idea that we've had to uh, kind of take that up to uh, elevate this somewhat. So um, as Mr. Curtin was mentioning, within the 30 to 45 days, those score reports are released. But we send through Mr. Curtin's office a letter out to families letting them know that they should be looking for these score reports within a certain block of time. Within that letter, we provide links and resources to the site that you had just seen up there about, you know, here's some additional information if you want to know about your student score in kind of parent-friendly language. But the idea that we have to elevate that somewhat is we are considering uh, sending no, there would be short animated videos out to families that are in conjunction with the letter that would be both in English and Spanish that would make it a little bit more accessible, we think, to be able to share that information with families and students. All right. I think that's a good, uh, a good measure to see if that works. Um, yeah, I was going to comment, too, on the discrepancy between you know, language acquisition and writing acquisition. And I'm sure there's similarities, you know, with uh, English dominant, you know, English speaking dominant families as well. Um, but as far as looking at, you know, what do we do about this? What are our next steps? I mean, kind of talking, uh, touching upon what uh, Dr. Uh, Hernandez Alexander mentioned, like what specifically are we tasking um, these students to do? What additional supports are they given to help with their writing skills? Um, I, I take my experience at RUSD, and obviously I wasn't an English learner, but um, not being a great writer until I had a, a great teacher that could teach writing. Uh, and and I remember the as much as I hated it, you just had to write every day, right? That's what you had to do, is you just had to write every day, and you do something, uh, practice it enough, and, and you're going to get better at that. So. Uh, I know that's way oversimplifying it, but what kind of strategy, specific strategies are we supporting teachers with to push down into the classroom so that students um, get more practice and hopefully acquire more skills in writing? We actually just also connected with our K-12 principal group in reviewing data and talking specifically about writing. So this conversation is very front and center um, with the work that we're doing ongoing. Um, for our English learners, ensuring that designated and integrated ELD are happening with those tools and that we're elevating and increasing the language opportunities that students experience on a daily basis. We know that they will transition to writing from oral language, so the more opportunities we have for them to have structured collaborative conversations with specific targeted language and language structures, that will eventually transition them to being more confident when they engage in writing experiences in their classroom. And then they have that tool right in front of them. They have a graphic organizer in front of them where they have collaborated with a peer, gathered language, and then are able to construct sentences. You alluded to having frequent opportunities and you need to just need to write every single day. And that is absolutely what we are encouraging all of our teachers across all content areas to engage students in doing. Even if it is just a short sentence or a couple of sentences, right. being able to 
collaborate with a peer, add more details to that sentence, provide evidence, add a more specific vocabulary word. Um, those are just some specific ideas, but we have given them an action plan of where to start. Some of those simple practices they can include just every single day, expecting complete sentences from students when they respond orally, um, breaking down a writing task. What is it asking me to do um, so that they know specifically what the task is? Using rubrics to, as a learner, know where I'm at with writing progress and know what the next step or goal is. Some of those basic tools for writing are things that we are recommitting to as a district and helping to support our teachers to leverage in the classroom across all content areas. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, a couple more questions for me. Um, for the students that are successful in, in reclassifying, um, have we done some kind of uh, like after reclassification survey or looked at some data to see maybe what what key measures, what um, key metrics were successful in them reclassifying, especially finding those patterns where students are reclassifying earlier? I will turn to my colleagues to add anything more other than what I will offer here. As our students do reclassify, we note that they are finding success with their written language. They're able to formulate sentences that are complete and have detail. They're able to access reading longer passages that have more complex thinking. They're able to analyze those things. So as they move along further in their years of education, the LPAC examination becomes more complex. So if they are able to reclassify sooner by the time they get through elementary school, then they're, they're Going, they're going to reclassify and they're not going to they're not going to exhibit and struggle struggle with language as they move forward because they've already reached that level of um, proficiency with language all right I think I'd be interested to know like if 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 there's any like specific benchmarks, like we know that if a kid can read by third grade, then they're going to be more successful, you know, in, in graduating. Like, are there other key metrics when kids reclassify um, that could be uh, that we could try to replicate with kids that are not having success in reclassifying? So there's a couple there. It's an excellent question. I think one of the key benchmarks we always look at and what we strive for and, and what Ms. Batchelder was, was alluding to was we really do target students reclassifying by grade six. And the reason we do that is when a student goes into secondary as an English learner, they uh, typically will continue to need more resources, but it also limits the amount of other courses they can take outside of the core or uh, intervention. So we know that that grade six is a really critical piece. And you've really hit on it. It's when students are progressing in their written language at the rate that is either the same or greater than their English speaking peers, we can usually point to that as a key indicator that a student is going to uh, be beyond the road to a rapid reclassification. What complicates this is as students are coming into our system at different entry points, within their grade experience, for example, at the upper grades of elementary, the requirements get much more rigorous as they go up, but they're still acquiring language. And so they have a doubly difficult um, challenge ahead of them that they have the rigors of more academic language to master as they're trying to master the linguistic oral pieces that they would have if they'd have come in sooner. So I, I, not to, I know it's, I gave a complicated answer, but no, part mean, of that is because this is a really complicated issue. I get to, it. I mean, it's, and, there's, and it's not like, a, it's not an isolating factor, right? There's other factors that, that are going into this that affect English learners. Um, and, and I know there's no like one answer to try to, 
find out how do we get more kids to reclassify because there's got to be a lot of different different ways to support kids to do so um, and I think there's always going to be the opportunity to try to, to get better at this because there's always going to your numbers are never going to be perfect because like you said you're always having new kids come into the system at different points so you're always going to have a number of kids that don't have the, the language to be able to re reclassify right and you're going to have you know all those levels one two and three um, and and, and, and I know it's a challenge, but you know, even with this data, it shows that 42.5% of our students are born right here locally. Um, so there are some students coming in from different entry points to our district, but most of them, most of them aren't. So I'd, I'd really like to, to get more information down the line on some of those key metrics that you mentioned. And if we see any patterns of success that we can try to learn from, um, you know, uh, she mentioned about the, the DLI program. I'd also like to see the, the DLI data, the, at least the students that were English learners that started uh, DLI and what their reclass rates are. And I'm guessing that they're higher. Um, so how do we employ those strategies to our students that are not in DLI that are not reclassifying yet? Um, and then the last piece, uh, my last question, and uh, you, could, you could get back to me later on, uh, has to do with some of the goals. So I know we have some of the next steps on what we do with this information and some of the strategies we're implementing to try to improve our reclass rates, but what can we expect uh, or what can we hope to see, I'll say, what can we hope to see if we have this presentation a year from now on our reclass rates? Well, I wanted to speak to that. One of the things we're in the midst of, we're going to be writing our new LCAP goals and, and metrics are a part of that. And one of the things that we will be striving for is, is that 4 and 5% growth in level 3 and 4 when we're talking about LPAC specific. Uh, specifically so and when we talk about CASP as well with our English learners probably even being a little bit more aggressive into that seven seven and a half range of, of proficiency so over a three-year period thank you trustee Lee Tr trustee Kinnear a, a couple of questions and a couple of comments uh, a question about long-term English learners at the uh, secondary level. What what does the uh, what does the instructional program look like for long-term English learners at the secondary level? Is it is it different for long-term English learners than it is for kids that are progressing through the the uh, the, the steps to uh, to to becoming reclassified, or or does the instructional program look the same, different? Our English learners in high school have a variety of resources, and it depends on their level of English proficiency, what kind of course they're enrolled in. Um, some of our, I'm just speaking to all English learners right now, because the LTELs are part of that group. Um, you have structured English language arts that's offered to students. It's a more rigorous, um, foundational skills course in high school that helps support students with learning the foundations of reading if they are a long-term English learner and they're still in the early levels of their proficiency level they would be engaged in a structured course a sheltered course is also an opportunity for English learners to be can, enrolled can in. you talk to me about I, I don't know what a structured so foundational skills for reading, writing, listening, and speaking are foundational in that course. So the students are immersed in more of the, the basic skills of learning how to read, how to write, um, phonemic awareness and phonics in their high school level ELD courses or their language arts course. So they're, they're, in, they're in a different class than, than say, a structured course would be comp comprised of 50% English learners and the other 50% non-English learners. Okay, so if I'm a long-term English learner, and uh, and uh, which which means I'm struggling in writing for sure, uh, I'm in a class with half the students who are not English learners and half the students who are struggling like I am. 
So there might be students at the high school level who are non-English learners who also require or by their learning have required a structured course to support them in learning. Uh, when we, uh, uh, when a teacher, a, t uh, a secondary teacher has 170 students on, on their caseload, how, how do they, uh, how do they know the individual needs of, of their English learners? Very good question. So all teachers have access to that software platform that I shared about and what I was telling you in the instructional response. The Elevation platform really gives them a close look at their English learner. Has, how long have they been an English learner? How long have they stayed at the same level of English level, language proficiency? Um, within that elevation platform, there's also a new resource I shared about that's called strategies, where they can actually go in, target the standard that they are providing instruction for, find strategies to support specific levels of English learners. So they are armed with that information about their specific learner and can then also use the resources within elevation software to help tailor um, their instruction. Yeah. I, I don't think that, uh, Mr. Lee, I don't think that you were oversimplifying the fact that in order to write better, you have to write more and you have to have feedback on your writing. I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's a given no matter, no matter what level uh, you are in, in terms of your experience with, uh, with, uh, with writing. Uh, if you want to write better, you have to write more and you have to have specific fee feedback. Do we know how much our secondary students write and how much feedback they get? Uh, is it have, have have do we have the ability to uh, to have some sense of uh, of of how much secondary schools uh, how much secondary schools students write and get feedback I think we rely there heavily on the engagement of our administration with teachers at the school site, their frequent visiting of their classrooms, of their campus, engagement in conversations and professional development at the site level that focuses on the need for writing and increasing language opportunities for students. I would also say that the partnerships with MTSS liaisons, where they offer small plate professional development mm -hmm. to teachers um, and are visiting classrooms and partnering with teachers and having conversations about how to engage the students in their classroom and offer different opportunities um, where they might not recognize how to structure their lesson um, or what resources are available. Our liaisons are that connection and capacity building resource in our system. So between our administrators observing, responding, giving feedback and setting expectations along with the partnership of the tools we have in place with our MTSS work, um, I think that is the initial place where we get a good pulse on what is happening in our, our classrooms. And we always have room to improve, to your point. Um, even reaching out to our families in partnership to help us increase language opportunities for students who during COVID did not have opportunities to even get out of the, the house, right, and engage socially with others. Um, the more opportunities we provide, um, even orally, then transfer to, to writing. So that is why our commitments are as such with the collaborative conversations, the sentence frames, and the graphic organizers so that we can increase all opportunities, the listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Do we have a sense from working with, uh, with uh, parents of English learners how much parents really understand the data that Mr. Lee was was referring to uh, do do from our experience do we really think that they know uh, I think teachers engage in conversations with parents when they identify that a student is struggling in any particular area we have processes that include parent conference time or even SST process when we have eliminated or used a variety of interventions and resources and then want to engage in further conversations to better support students. I do think that our, our 
teachers and parents have, engage in those conversations? Can we engage in more conversations meaningfully throughout the course of the year? I would challenge us to continue to, to do that um, and educate about the resources that we have. Our family website is that first step in trying to make sure that those resources are at the fingertips of our families. The EL1 in particular highlights information about the LPAC, about reclassification, so it's a great first step and reaching out and communicating the importance of that. The, the there's, there's a, a higher concentration of special ed students who are long-term English learners. Does our special ed program for long-term English learners look differently uh, for long-term English speakers than it does for, uh, for special ed students who are English speakers? I wouldn't necessarily say that it is different. I think language acquisition would be different for every student based on where they are at, where they are performing with their language development. So it might be different for a special education student with one specialized need and versus a, a different special education student with a different need. Um, we do know that 80% of disabilities are based in a language need. So that correlates with, with what we see as far so as... So does the instructional program for a special ed student who's an English learner look differently than and a long-term English learner than a, than a special ed student who's uh, an English learner? I would say that all students benefit from those same fundamental skill development that we've shared with you here tonight. Um, it wouldn't look necessarily different unless the IEP goal for that particular student outlined a, a more elevated need based on that individual student's and profile. If I, can, if I can jump in for just a minute, Mr. Kinnear, uh, just to be mindful also that students with special needs would have their individualized learning plan. Mm -hmm. So some of their goals and um, the strategies that teachers would use and resources that they use might differ for that student because of their IEP, which includes them being an English learner. So it wouldn't be the overall instructional program, but it might be the resources and strategies that the teacher is using in order to meet the IEP goals. Okay. I think that, that's it, thanks. Thank you, Trustee Kinnear. Uh, I have a few comments and questions to expand upon the great deliberation for my colleagues. You know, the first thing I want to start with is, uh, you know, when we come go to conferences and hear about, you know, what uh, the cutting edge research and best practices on these things, sometimes I, I get the sense that, you know, there's too much of an emphasis that anybody who's an English learner, that there's, they're operating from some uh, uh, point of deficiency. And I think, uh, I'm not saying that that's happening here, but, uh, but what I am trying to allude to is, you know, obviously the inverse of that, how much are we acknowledging the fact that if you're if you have uh, if you're a proficient in a language and you're actually trying to expand into a you know to be bilingual or trilingual or whatever the case may be that that's really a, can be an asset and coming from it from that kind of frame of mind and and thinking how would you respond to that Any time that we're engaging, if I'm understanding the question correctly, if any time we're engaging in learning multiple languages, we're engaging our brain to process similarities and differences also between language. So looking at that as an asset, if a student is coming in and has foundation in multiple languages, that can that would be a great asset for them moving forward and learning and acquiring language faster. But what I mean is like in the manner in which we, uh, th th we project programmatically to support our English learner students and uh, the, the basis of the curriculum, does it reflect those, that type of sentiments and approach? Dr. Farouk, if I may jump yeah. in, if I'm understanding your question. We have the stated position in English Learner Services that we will leverage student assets that they bring in. And that is part of our messaging, that is part of our fundamental belief within instructional services to leverage student assets, both linguistic, cultural, and all of the above as we come in to um, 
to heighten their outcomes. So that is something that comes out of our division regularly. That's fantastic. That's exactly what I was alluding to. Uh, expanding on that very premise also, from a cultural standpoint, how much are we leaning into uh, their cultural identity, their heritage and history, to uh, not just in, uh, foster a sense of pride, but then also, again, to lean into better uh, student engagement and then you know, driving to um, how that correlates to learning uh, English. We shared a little bit of that information within our uh, DLI presentation a couple of meetings ago, and I know that it was specific to DLI, but... Um, Can uh, I just say one thing about the DLI? The, yes. the reason why I, I want to distinguish from that is because it is a self-selected program, and so just inherently, if, some, if, a, if a family has chosen to say, I'm going to lean in and opt into something, there's just a, a different mindset. Not that there's not things we can draw from it, but I want to know distinctly separate from that as well. Thank you, and, and what I was trying to get to, but I wasn't communicating very clearly, was conceptually, we take the same approach with our English learner services that we do um, in the program in that leveraging culture, understanding culture, having cultural relevance, having cultural understanding is just as important in a classroom with English learners as it is in any classroom. Or um, in a classroom with ethnically diverse people, um, that that's part of how we within instructional services also embrace our equity tenants. Um, knowing and understanding culture, we truly believe um, elevates the learning experience for all students. How deep does this go? So like, let me give you an example. Um, so, you know, 89.9% .9 is, is Spanish. So within the Spanish speaking world, there's obviously a wide range of dialects, especially if you're, uh, you know, um, if you're growing up uh, in that kind of household d dynamic. So how much are we taking the distinctions into account of those different cultures uh, within Spanish speaking? And then obviously the other 10% um, being, you know, completely different uh, languages in and of themselves. How much is that, that kind of disaggregated nuance taken into account? From a data standpoint, we don't necessarily disaggregate and send out uh, that type of information. But what I can say as a former principal is being a building principal, a leader at my own school, um, I knew of my families and the culture of my families and encouraged our teachers to do that as well. And knowing our leaders here, they take that same approach. So um, we, uh, we encourage and empower and expect our leaders on campuses to engage and know their families and be part of the community and go to events and, and things. I know as a teacher, I would have uh, students that would invite me to their quinceañeras or invite me to uh, their soccer games or invite me to anything. And that's how we build that understanding in community. And that's something that we foster. But I can't say that I can put a number to it per se. I know that it is a belief that we have and we encourage schools to do such. I would just encourage, I know this is a heavy lift, uh, so I don't know how feasible it is, but again, even within a country, the different regions of a country, there's such distinctly different, um, you know, again, dialects and, and culture and personalities and so forth. So I think the more, because again, I think from an asset building and looking at it as a strength uh, that they're coming in with, uh, I think to do that in like a 2.0 version, if we're able to to have take into account those distinctions within these cultures. And again, I, if, if for the non-Spanish speaking, you know, the, the distinctly different cultures, how much of those different things are being incorporated in the curriculum and uh, those perspectives, I think th that's, there, there could be some potential there to, to move the needle. Because that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to move the needle. And so that's why I'm leaning into, you know, maybe the, 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 some of those strategies could be helpful. Thank you for the suggestion. Um, so the, the next question I have is, you know, you mentioned that by definition, there's, there's families coming in at different grade levels, you know, by nature. I mean, in general, that applies to any, whether it's English learners or, or non-English learners. What, my question is, is related to English learners, how much of it is different in the sense that is there more discontinuity where people are coming in like a different grade levels or how much of it is by and large they're all starting at kindergarten and they're going through the whole system because the again the reason i bring that up is that would obviously reflect more critically or uh, understanding the, the the results that 
our district is pr producing, right? Like, if they're with us from kindergarten all the way through, it's, and it's, it's not moving the needle, that says something. And how much of it is like, you know, they're coming in right at high school, or, uh, you know, you gave that sixth grade threshold. Are they coming in after the sixth grade where it's already, you know, a bigger challenge? How would you, how would you answer that? Well, it would definitely be, that, that's an interesting question as it relates to, you know, identifying when they come in and then how much service they're getting and then how they're performing. And that's something definitely to take back. We did share a little bit that on average, when we looked at our high school students, um, six years on average. So we know that, that some, a, a large number of our high school students are coming into us later. We don't have them the whole time. And then as Dr. Sosa had shared the, the complexity and the dynamics after that sixth grade, becomes more and more uh, it becomes more difficult it's a journey not only to learn the language but also the the rigors of the standards but do we have like specific strategies that it, depending on what uh, when their point of engagement with the district is that we take we're taking those things into account uh, not just that okay I, they're coming in at this grade so if a student was at that grade this is these are the strategies we would be engaging with them uh, but knowing that that lack of continuity, do you want to say something? It, it would be more by their language level, Dr. Farouk. So um, when Ms. Ms. Batchelder was explaining, well, however much language the student can produce, regardless of what grade they are, would kind of dictate the strategies that the teacher could use and would use. But, but what about, because I think that's obviously should be the foundational aspect. What about just the fact of if they've been in our system, mm -hmm. The, the, the strategies that we've been doing, they're going to have, a, at some point, they're going to start having a synergy effect, right? Because they're being reinforced and they're, it, it's, it's our organizational culture is being embedded in as well. They're, so the, the students that are, are entering at different stages, inherently, they're, they're not going to have that, they're going to have a bigger challenge, right? Because they're, they're coming in cold. And so the, if it's purely based on the, the language thing, I feel like it's not taking into account uh, that, yeah, that especially, and I mean organizational culture, not necessarily, uh, the, 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 it, that's not been fully embedded in, uh, with those students. I, I, so you don't have to answer this now. One, I just would think that, I hope that we can take those things into, into consideration. Two, I think from a data standpoint, it's just like you know disaggregating some of this stuff too I think it would be very interesting for us to know this is the percentage in numbers that come in through the whole spectrum from K through 12 the percentages of, of likely entering because that gives the board something to work with like if like again if by and large a lot of them are coming in after the sixth grade level you know again that has a we're, we're, we're inheriting a different set of challenges there um, is there anything you want to say to that or is there something to think about? I just wanted to add students as they come into our, our district, to Renee's point, they come in at different levels and then at different grade levels. It's also different in different areas of our school district, the rate of students that um, move or have interrupted education and move from school to school. Um, so all of those things are things that we want to take into consideration. That's why it's front and center in the instructional response. First, understanding who are the English learners in our classroom so that then we can tailor the instructional response based on their English learner level when they entered um, our school district, what, what the needs are of that particular content area that I'm teaching with that particular student. Um, so we, it's a multi-layered thing, but absolutely front and center, looking at the, the cultural background of the student, um, the years they've been in schools, all of those things we lead and are supporting our teachers to inquire within the elevation um, software I, I alluded to as well. They can have all of that information at their fingertips and then use that to make some instructional decisions. Two more questions. Um, one is regarding reclassification. So, you know, f for, the, uh, for the students that do get reclassified, do we have any kind of mechanism where they themselves provide mentorship and some kind of 
direct support back to the, their younger counterparts to help them along from like firsthand experience? That's a really interesting idea. We don't currently have that, but I'd like to explore that and we'll take that into consideration. Thank you for that idea. Thank you. And then uh, my last question is, do we have a breakdown of our uh, metrics between the Spanish speaking and non-Spanish speaking? That's a metric we can we can look into and get for you, absolutely. The, and the reason I'm bringing that up is because, again, we're trying to find where is the low-hanging fruit, where can we drive some of these numbers. And this part I'm speculating, so I don't know, but if, if we have 89%, 89.9% Spanish speaking, maybe some of our staff are more specialized in those areas as a, and as a district because we're it's such a significant population. Um, and if there is a disproportionate deficiency on the other 10%, maybe some strategic invest engagements there might disproportionately drive the needle to increase, because 10% is still 10%, you know. Um, I mean, every student, whether it's even 0.01%, uh, it matters. But um, I'm just trying to think of where we can get areas to kind of move, the, move our numbers. So um, thank you. if you can look into that. Okay, so Superintendent Hill, did you, is there anything else you wanted to add? No. Okay, um, we'll turn now back to our student. Yeah, I have one more question. We, so they all, we just went through the, the full board now, so every, we're gonna go through everyone. Um, so we'll start with our student board member, Amy. So I recognize the purpose of the ELD program being first and foremost establishing just that um, language acquisition and student proficiency in English. But as we're discussing that a lot of these students are coming in, moving past, um, at the sixth grade level and moving past the sixth grade level, coming from a student perspective, I recognize that this is where a lot of that college and career readiness push starts coming at students. And I'm wondering a few things. I'm wondering what are the college and career resources that are provided to these students? Because obviously, if they're coming in later, they have less time in the program and they need to know what's out there for them once they get out. And then what are, are we tracking the current college and career outcomes of these students once they move past um, 12th grade? So let me take a stab at that, Ms. Nama. You ask phenomenal questions, by the way. This is a great <laughs> first meeting, um, so insightful. So in terms of the college and career readiness uh, options, the full menu of options at a comprehensive high school is open to any student that's on that high school mm -hmm. campus. Um, but if I may be understanding the, the nuance of your question, are we targeting specific uh, actions and resources towards our high school English learners? Is that what you're asking, or were you more asking, do we, do these students have a limited number of options? I guess I'm asking both where one are, because obviously when you are acquiring a language in um, a new, for a lot of students, a new country, it's very difficult to break into the career field and the kind of college arena so their experience is going to be different with that so yes i am wondering if there are specific resources targeted towards them and then um for the clarifying the second part of your question just i'm wondering yes if then even though technically all of the college and career opportunities that a school offers are open to all students. How are we addressing some of the possible limitations that these students encounter within that? So some of the language demands that, mm -hmm. are, that are in those, excellent. And this was something that Ms. Batch Elder um, alluded to, but it was really quick in the presentation. Those strategies that we're saying are district commitments, we're having district commitments in those same strategies that give students access throughout the instructional program, which would include CTE courses and other uh, college and career readiness opportunities. 
We also have a pretty unique position at our high schools that we call, or well, really they're at all schools, but at our high schools, they're really important just by the number of students, and we call them EL contacts. And that is a uh, teacher, typically, who's on campus, who um, provides extra support and mentorship to our English learner students. Not only does that uh, EL contact person kind of be the uh, one of the point people within our English learners journey within high school for uh, more of, um, of the uh, paperwork um, options, but they're also somebody to connect that student with resources when they need it. So not only, as we were saying, do teachers know their students, as you know from, you know, your teachers build a relationship with you, but our EL contacts are also building relationships with our students too and actively connecting them with resources that will help them to get to the journey that they want to go to. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't mean to focus so much on numbers since obviously these are students and like Dr. Farouk was saying, every student counts, like whether it's 10%, 89%. Um, but I'm wondering what, percentage of our EL students are able to make that use of those resources and are pursuing that? Uh, we would be able to provide that to mm -hmm. the board. That's not a number I have off the top yeah. of my head, in other words. <laughs> We'd be able to provide that on request. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, student board member Nami. Dr. hernandez Alexander. I have a question about strategies and the, really the impact of strategies as it, as, it as it pertains to language acquisition. And um, we may not be able to discuss this here, but I would like to ask if you could um, indulge me in, um, and indulge in the board with information on how, I'd, I'd like to understand the difference between the strategies employed in DLI to learn Spanish compared to the strategies employed for English learners and the strategies employed for foreign language. Like anecdotally, I see that our English learners who are just taking Spanish or French tend to be stronger in their written language, in the new written language, than orally. Because they just like, they remember the things, they conjugate things, and they write it down. <clears throat> Which we're seeing the reverse being uh, the result in our English learners. So I'm curious if it's because the strategies of teaching the language is, are different, my, my assumption here. So I'd, I'd like to see what that is. I'd, I'd like to understand how and why we, we employ different strategies of language learning in those three spaces. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Yes, it does make sense. And students who are typically taking a, a second language, so we're talking about like their high school or middle school course, they're further along in establishing maybe their primary language as well, which does impact their ability then to take on a second language. But when we're talking about dual immersion um, students in elementary school and their strategies that they're employing to learn language alongside our English learners and how they're em engaged to learn language, there are a lot of similarities between both um, acquisition processes, but we can, I'd be happy to highlight more. Yeah, I, I would like to go deeper in that because speaking from an assets-based perspective, many of our students are coming in with very strong language mm -hmm. skills in their own language, mm -hmm. but we're not seeing that, like, it's not a, it's, we're not seeing the same result. So, other, so there's all these other things happening, right? Cultural differences, a new place, there might be some trauma that came, you know, along with having to move to a new country, all of that, I think, plays into it. But I am very curious to just learn the, how we acquire language, how we strat, what the strategy is to, to, to teach a language and what the differences are. So uh, however we do that, if we agendize it or not, or if we just send it, I think it's something that could be edifying for all of us to learn. So I'd like to see that on an agenda item if possible. Thank you, Trustee Kinnear. I think the 
million dollar question. Uh, how are our kids doing this year? Are we, gonna, are we on track to meet our goals? Uh, and I ask that question uh, because it's, it's obvious to all of us uh, it, in the district, not just, the, not just board members, that the success of EL kids is really important to us. Uh, should this board be looking at uh, other resources to, to support the academic achievement of our English learners? Are we moving in the right direction? What's, what's the data telling us after one quarter of the way through, the, more than one quarter of the way through this school year. Uh, what's the data telling us as it relates to are we going to meet these goals uh, th this, this coming year? I'm going to touch on that in a few different aspects. One, we do have indication we've reduced our long-term English learners. So that is one area of achievement that I think we should recognize so that we can see that the strategies we have been employing have been beginning to make that impact. Our reclassification rate is higher, as Sean alluded to in the, the data presented. Um, we're already in a point of 200 plus reclassifications already at this point in the year, and we have not yet engaged in the next level assessment opportunities that could allow far more students to reclassify. So we're already on track to reclassify even more again than we did in the prior year. Um, our lost links data, the formative assessment tool that we um, have leveraged over the last several years, um, Preliminary data is back from that. It'll be complete and final um, after November 26th, but right now um, the indications it's scored in five levels, but in comparison to last fall, fall 22 to fall 2023, 20, um, there are less students um, scoring at the level one and two level versus fall 22 and more students scoring at the levels three, four, and five level than they did in 2022 with that formative assessment tool that we've been using. Thank you both uh, for such a, a very substantive uh, quality discussion on such an important topic. It's, it's always an honor to be a part of a, a, a governance board that takes these issues very seriously. So thank you for that. We are going to take a 12-minute break and reconvene at 8.40 p.m. Thank you.
Okay, we are reconvening our board meeting at 8.45 p.m. And we're going to move to the next portion of our report, which is 2023-2024 Local Control and Accountability Plan. So I turn it over to Dr. Jackie Perez. Good evening, President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and board members. The, the purpose of this evening's presentation is truly in response to the Board of Education's um, expressed interest to hear frequent updates on the LCAP, steps in progress monitoring, highlighted actions, and engagement activities through the year. So this presentation tonight will provide an overview a uh, bird's eye view of the new LCAP cycle. We're concluding our um, third year of the LCAP and then starting a new LCAP. Some planned engagements, a highlighted action, and um, immediate next steps. You'll also um, get to spend a little bit of time with our new LCAP director, Mr. Chris Geyer, and he will be walking through the rest of the presentation and always, always, especially with LCAP, this is definitely a district-wide process. Um, we're always open to your feedback and suggestions um, for a process. So Mr. Geyer will proceed through the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Perez. And good evening. Thank you, I appreciate this opportunity to be here and speak with you. Um, the local control funding formula is the primary funding source for the LCAP. The LCAP principally serves our unduplicated students, which are English learners, our low-income students, or our, our socio socioeconomically disadvantaged, and our foster youth. Um, students are counted once, even if they qualify in more than one category, hence the unduplicated. And in our district, um, approximately 74% of our students are classified as unduplicated. Our board approved the 21-24 LCAP goals. All 65 of the current LCAP actions are aligned to meet the state priorities and primarily serve our unduplicated students. There are a few recent and impending changes in legislation that I would like to highlight. The first is more explicit language in including students with disabilities in the LCAP. The LCAP, although primarily addresses um, foster youth, low income, um, and English learners, it also specifies that any student groups that are underperforming should also be considered. Um, and the state says very much so that special education should be part of that. The um, special education administrator for the district should be consulted in the development and implementation of the plan. I present to our special education advisory committee and the parent lead on that committee is also a member of our, um, parent, our LCAP parent advisory. Um, the, um, excuse me, the, our English learners are disaggregated. So a change that is um, just took place last, or excuse me, coming up in this summer, is that we are looking at our long-term English learners separate from our English learner population in general. So this um, is looking at what my colleagues were presenting before us. They have unique and distinct needs, and we want to ensure that we are meeting those needs um, to the best of our ability. Um, and then also there's been a change where um, the status of an English learner has been extended before they become classified as, a, as an LTEL, as a long-term English learner. Currently it's been five years. The change me, um, is to seven years. So looking at statewide, what it takes to um, support our English learners, the state is giving us a little more leeway um, to meet their needs. Lastly, um, the change coming up this summer in July is adding students to the parent advisory. Student voice has always been an important part of the work that we do here in this district, and we've always had students. So we're taking this one step further and we're creating a, um, a student advisory where we'll have a chance to meet with students at middle schools and high schools and really get a deep understanding of their perspective. Um, presented the idea with our student board members. They seemed very excited about it. Had an opportunity to pitch that with the superintendent's uh, student advisory. Had some great questions, some great feedback about how, how to reach out and how to include. 
Um, so we'll be moving forward with that, doing recruiting through December and hopefully having our first meeting with them in January with quarterly meetings after that. The LCAP functions in a three-year cycle. So we are in year three of three of the current plan. So we will continue to monitor the effectiveness of the existing plan um, while we collaborate with our educational partners, our families, students, staff, county, governing board to develop the 22, uh, excuse me, the 24-27 LCAP. We continue to strive for meaningful stakeholder engagement. The LCAP development process, um, we work with our lo local education partners. We believe strongly that they possess valuable perspectives and insights about our programs and services and help us identify potential goals and actions to be included in the LCAP. Um, we have regular input and feedback meeting with our parents. Um, for instance, we have our parent advisory. I present to our district English language learner advisory committee, our special education community advisory committee, our district African American advisory committee, to name just a few. I had the priv privilege of presenting to our RCPTA earlier this week at the Arlington Public Library. Um, and then, of course, um, we will continue to provide board updates on the progress on both the 20 to 24 plan, as well as the development of our next three-year plan. We'll share community input, data for guidance, um, data seeking guidance from the board, particularly on actions and goals uh, for consideration in the next plan. One action I'd like to highlight for you is 1.4B. Um, this is led by our innovation and learner engagement team, which by the way are the same folks that um, did the Ignite Her Mind today. So really dynamic group that does a lot to um, build capacity internally with our staff as well as work with our community. Um, so some examples here in the bottom left, the picture if teachers, um, they're meeting, so our, excuse me, our LA team is meeting with teachers to increase depth of knowledge in the lessons, seeing students as problem solvers in particular, using Legos in this case to build collaboration, communication, critical thinking skills. There's also examples of coding with micro bits and make code arcade. And they host family innovation nights. In this case, there's an example of early coding, which is done in the elementary with a father and son. This is block coding using little Sphero Indies or little cars. So each of those color tiles um, gives a direction to the car, but they're not labeled. So the student or the child in this case has to test it. So this color makes the car move forward. It makes it stop. It makes it turn. So once this, the child identifies what the tiles do, they can lay them out in a sequence that then programs the car to perform an action. Move forward, turn left, stop, back up. So that lays the foundation for early coding, which is then built into more formal coding at the secondary levels. Um, another area that they um, take the lead on is digital citizenship. And in this case, digital citizenship refers to responsible and ethical behavior to live, learn, and work in an interconnected digital world. Every student in the district is required to receive lessons on di digital citizenship. Um, been tremendously successful. We already have 100% completion at the secondary level. That means every high school student in the district has received all of their lessons on di digital citizenship and we already have 98.7% completion at the elementary level. We expect that to be 100% quite soon. Um, and this is earlier than we usually have this data in the year, so really excited about the work the team's doing and how well it's being received district-wide and the impact that it's having on our students. In looking ahead, um, in December and January, we will be promoting and distributing a district-wide LCAP survey. So that will go out to all members of our community. Um, we will begin our community listening sessions in January and February. So that will be in-person and virtual. Um, 
excuse me, in February, we'll be back for an LCAP mid-year report to the Board of Education sharing data and progress on the current plan. Um, and again, this is all in attempting to receive, excuse me. Um, sorry, I lost my place. So again, this is all to receive guidance and input from our community and from the board on establishing priorities and direction for the 2427 Local Control Accountability Plan. The QR code there links to the LCAP area of our district website. So if anybody cares to go there, you can, um, the doc LCAP is available in English and in Spanish. There are summaries of the plan and the data, as well as information on our meetings, um, our minutes, where our meetings are held, um, and how you can participate. This concludes the presentation. After public comment, we welcome your feedback and suggestions to improve our current practices for creating our next LCAP. Thank you. Thank you so much for that great presentation. Dr. Hernandez Alexander, do we have public input? Thank you. Sandy R. Welcome, Ms. R. You have three minutes. Thank you. So again, uh, I think with the LCAP, this is um, the final year of this, these goals. And so I just would hope that you're going to give us the results, you know, like, was, was this successful? Because I would hate to see that you just continue something similar and there was no results. We're still down. I mean, the kids are still down five to six percent in math and ELA from pre-COVID numbers. And the ESSER money is going away and Parents want to know, are we going to get our kids back to where they need to be? Now, some kids are, some kids aren't. And it's been shown that minority students were most impacted by the COVID um, learning loss. The numbers show it, your numbers show it. Um, so I would hope that you're assessing and, and looking at these um, plans that you put in place to see if they really were effective. And if they weren't effective, that you have a plan B. What are we going to try for the next three years of the LCAP? And again, the community engagement is important. I, you have, what, $144 million that this LCAP looks at to, to spend. And part of the problem is you don't have enough parents that represent those students that you're supposed to impact with that money giving you feedback. I, I know who goes to the meetings. I know some of them personally. I know where they live. I know they're not socioeconomically disadvantaged. I know their kids. I know if they're, so I'm telling you, you don't have the parents that meet those classifications to be getting their feedback. You really need to reach out to more people in the community. And I think part of the problem is you don't put it out there to the whole community and say, you know, does anyone meet these qualifications and want to participate? You reach out to them selectively. And I think that's part of the problem. And that's why you're not getting the numbers that you need to get in terms of having the feedback and the voices that you need to be listening to. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the public input uh, for this agenda item. Do we have comments and questions from the board? We'll start with our student board member, Nami. I was just wondering, what are some of the current practices that are being employed to let parents know about um, LCAP and in reaching out to them to get them involved and get their input? Good question. And we've done a lot of reflecting from last year to this year, and our Board of Education has been great with providing a lot of suggestions. Um, so a few things that we've done for this year, and we're still kind of early in the year, but continuing to do, um, is reach out to, um, uh, so it's two pieces. One for a parent advisory. Um, that is a smaller group who provides advice and feedback to, for the development of the LCAP. That's not the sole parent community mm -hmm. um, input piece. We have the LCAP survey that does go out to families. We have our um, uh, climate and culture survey that goes out to uh, parents and students, as well as 
the meetings that Mr. Geyer is attending with the various parent advisory groups, which includes the targeted mm -hmm. student populations that we're reaching, our students with disabilities, our English learners, and also working closely with our um, foster homeless department. So some of the changes, in addition to, um, we got some great feedback about our community um, listening sessions, calling it a different name, but also broadcasting it widely, doing them in person, in different locations, as well as um, virtual, to give as many opportunities. All of that is alongside us monitoring the data of how these actions are, are actually doing. So it's kind of a multifaceted way to try and get feedback from everyone, as well as staff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Trustee Lee. Um, I was just going to comment on uh, the student part and getting students involved. Uh, the first time we did um, LCAP, when trying to solicit input from the community, uh, we were going out into school sites, uh, secondary school sites, and the sessions were led by students, typically government, but other, other groups of students were involved. Um, and that strategy usually got the parents of those students to show up. So at least it, it got more, you'd see a room like at Ramona High School, NPR, every seat was full because you had the students there uh, supporting their friends who were leading the session and then you also had their, their families that were there that wanted to see their kids leading the sessions. Um, so I think that could be one strategy that we look at again, especially since we're not in this uh, pandemic world, so it's easier to get people on campus. So that would be one suggestion. Um, also, with some of the surveys we've sending out, I mean, I think we've had pretty good luck on response rates for as far as surveys goes, but any way we can incentivize parents and families to do that, I don't know what that incentive could be, but um, providing something for their time. I think would be worth investing in. Okay. That's Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Lee. I, th I think we're fortunate that uh, we've taken a, an, a different kind of approach as a board now that we're, we're taking small bites at this issue throughout the year. So it doesn't feel like when the LCAP comes that it's, you know, this is very ambitious effort. Um, I just have a couple comments. Uh, you know, to me, the most critical thing, especially in, a, in an update version like this, is the community engagement, uh, you know, parent engagement, student engagement, and so forth. And I know you said that there's different ways of touch points and access and all that. I, what I'm interested in is how it's evolving year to year, uh, because, um, in, and especially re related to the unduplicated populations specifically, uh, because inherently, you know, if, uh, if people are working odd hours or, you know, more difficult jobs and so forth, that even if they want to, it's just a matter of practicality. So w w from year to year, w how, do you th how are we continuing to be expansive and more inclusive on those efforts? Uh, well, one of the pieces, especially with wanting to gather the input from our unduplicated families, um, what Mr. Geyer has done um, since he started just a short time ago um, is really is capture all of the list of our families and start making calls to see which ones are available to either serve on our parent advisory or, or at least to be able to be engaged in, in, in any way. The other piece is also the transition to moving to having a student advisory group. That one's new now with the new legislation. We've always had students involved in the LCAP parent advisory, um, but we're trying it out this year um, to try and get more of a robust, unduplicated student voice into the LCAP by um, employing and having our student board members um, serve as facilitators. So this ties directly with Mr. Lee's comment too, is having students facilitate the listening sessions um, and using their um, knowledge and skills at the school site to really work directly at the high schools and middle schools with getting that unduplicated voice. So um, I think those are two things that we've listened a lot through the last couple years to try out this year. And I'm not saying that student government doesn't have unduplicated populations, but we're being intentional that if the students are leading it, that they're going to be from the unduplicated populations. 
Yes, that they are involved and part of that student advisory. What about at the point of like a parent-teacher meetings, you know, that, that happen? Uh, what about trying to recruit and, uh, you know, encourage teachers to share these opportunities for parents to be involved at that level? Because then, you okay. know, the, 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 the teachers have a better understanding of what the nature of those students, you know, where, where they come from. Could that be a way to, because I just think that personal touch, you know, we get as parents so many of these, <laughs> of these notifications, of like, like 10 events, you know, and all this stuff. So I just feel like even well-meaning people, they're just, the, you know, the LCAP advisory or LCAP input or surveys, it's just, it'll just get lost in the shuffle. Uh, so I don't know if, is that a feasible thing or is that a collective bargaining thing or is that... Yeah, and, and that was actually a point that the students brought up when we met um, earlier in the week about building on existing relationships and recruiting for the student advisory and reaching out to the um, teachers, particularly those that have um, high numbers of unduplicated students in their classes and using them to help recruit um, going through students building that, re that relationship. And I think once we start to build that and parents become connected, then I agree that that becomes another point we can reach out and saying, you know, your student is a part of this. There are parent opportunities. Would you, would you like to be a part of those and have a similar voice, but with your peers or with other parents? It, it, it's not only a personal touch, it's right. a touch from a trusted source, right? And it's, and it's also something that naturally is already a mechanism that's happening. And so uh, I think there would be great value. And obviously, when I say this, I'm referring to SAP counselors, uh, the you know, college and career counselors. I mean, any area where th there could be some meaningful interaction. Trustee Lee. Thank you. Sorry, your, your line of questions made me think of two other things. I know I brought these things up before, but just as a reminder, I think when we're asking parents and students to participate in this process, we don't call it the LCAP advisory, right? Because I think it's boring and most people don't know what LCAP stands for. And when you tell them what it stands for, it doesn't compute. So I think we've got to come up with some more engaging title to get people to participate. Um, and then also we use the term listening sessions too. And to me, that's a very like passive way to classify something. And I don't want to have to listen to something and I don't want it to be listened to. So I don't know what we, again, we call it, but I think we need to kind of fancy up our marketing terms to get people to participate. So it feels like if I, if I don't answer this question in the survey, if I don't take advantage of this opportunity to come to my kid's school, um, then I'm missing out on something, right? Uh, and it is hard to D Dr. Farouk's point. <clears throat> Parents have a million things going on and it's not that they don't care about the big picture of what's happening in the district. But they, what they really care about is, how is this going to help my kid? How is this going to help my, the kids, uh, you know, my, my, my kid's friends, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we use that to engage them? Because it ultimately will affect their student, you know, the, the students their kids play with. So I think we've got to take a fresh look on how we ask people to participate and the terminology that we use, the vocabulary that we use. Thank you. Thank you both for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Our next report is regarding the 2023-2024 plan for the Educator Effectiveness Block Grant, uh, or EEBG. And so I'll turn it back over again to Dr. Dr. Jackie Press. Well, hello again and good evening. Um, this is a very brief report. Um, to provide an update from the original Educator Effectiveness Block Grant Report that was presented back in December 2020, 2022. Uh, now, there is a reporting mechanism for the state, however, does not require board approval at this time, but in the spirit of transparency, um, we wanted to provide an update from the changes from the original plan, and Mr. Dunlop is going to provide the update. Thank you, Dr. Perez. Uh, good evening, uh, Board President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, members of the board. Uh, as Dr. Perez indicated, this is an update from actually April of 2022. We brought before the board a, an action item to approve the Educator Effectiveness Block Grant. Um, this evening, we'll go very quickly through just an overview of the grant, talk about the legislation behind that. We'll go and talk about a little bit about how those funds are being used this year and how they'll be used in the future years, and then a little bit of looking ahead in terms of metrics and uh, reporting to the state. 
So the Educator Effectiveness Block Grant Fund uh, was established through legislation in 2021 through AB 130 and then modified in 2022 through AB 181. Uh, what this does is provide funds for school districts to provide professional development in, in specific high needs areas. The professional learning is designated for teachers, administrators, and classified staff who work with students on a regular basis. The district was allocated $8.7 million for, uh, from this fund, and those are available to the district to spend through June 30th of 2026. When we brought the item before the board in April of 2022, uh, we brought forth two items uh, that were out allowed through the legislation. One was uh, addressing positive uh, school climate and culture. Uh, this was, uh, we, we indicated this would be achieved through unconscious bias training for all of our staff. And as I indicated in my report last uh, board meeting, that is currently an initiative that is underway. It is a three-year initiative in which we are training all of our staff, certificated, classified, and management uh, in unconscious bias training. The second was uh, to support uh, the rollout of ethnic studies curriculum. That was an allowable use under the, the legislation. And so the funds were used to support the professional development for teachers who are engaging uh, in ethnic studies curriculum. Now, moving forward in this year and, and in the future years, the additional, this is the additional component that we are adding to this plan. Uh, we are using the funds to support our history, social science, uh, instructional materials adoption. Uh, the board last year adopted new history social science materials for our elementary uh, classrooms. We're using these funds to support teachers in learning how to use those uh, resources in the classroom. Additionally, we are uh, using these funds to support our professional growth systems. Uh, to continue the work of our instructional design team. This was something I highlighted in our last uh, board report in October, the team that builds all of our asynchronous or online courses for our staff. Uh, again, this will, these funds will also be used to uh, pay for our professional development platforms that I talked about last time that help us to track uh, attendance and feedback from our teachers and staff on professional development. And then the last two areas will be uh, to support professional development, ongoing professional development in the area of multi-tiered systems of support, or MTSS, that is led by our instructional services division. And then finally, I think the area that we're most excited about is um, that we'll be using a lot of these funds to support our classified staff. We are working with uh, professional growth systems, specifically the classified end of PGS, to uh, design and deliver classified training to not just PGS classified staff, but staff. Uh, training that will be available for all classified staff uh, across the district. Uh, just in closing, uh, two things that we are required to do for the grant is to monitor professional development as we move forward, how these funds are spent. Each year we are to report to the state on an annual basis of how we use the funds. That's done in September of every year. And then finally, we do a final report in September of 2026, uh, just indicating how these funds were uh, for how they were used and how they were uh, used to support those three different uh, areas I talked about, our classified staff, our certificated staff, as well as our management. So that concludes the presentation for this evening. Again, the purpose was um, not necessarily to get uh, an action item on this. We've, this has already been approved. We don't need to bring it back to the board. It's not a requirement by the grant or by the California Department of Education, but in just to be transparent and to let the board know how we uh, intend to use the funds, we wanted to bring that before you this evening. So after public comment, we'd be more than happy to answer any questions or take any comments. Thank you for that uh, gesture to be proactive and transparent as you pivoted to ex be more expansive in the use of that uh, grant uh, funds. Dr. Hernandez, Alexander, do we have any public input on this item? No, we do not. Okay. Uh, are there any comments or questions? It's just a, just an update on the... Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dunlap. So our last agenda item is will be from actually our newest assistant superintendent, Mr. Oren Williams. We're very delighted to have him here at our district back again. And so he'll be providing information and overview about that, our administrative facilities in the school district. I was hoping my presentation was going to be quicker than Mr. Dunlap's, but I'm not sure. But I'll give it, I'll give it my best try. But good evening, uh, President Dr. Farouk, Superintendent Hill, members of the board. Uh, the item before you this evening is a very brief discussion regarding our district administrative facilities. And um, so this presentation specifically supports uh, two of the board priorities focusing on well-being and communication. Uh, we'll be reviewing three different elements that are impacting our administrative facilities, provide a detailed example of one of those impacts, 
and then summarizing with a staff recommendation for next steps. Here you can see in this map um, our administrative uh, functions are far flung across our sizable district. Um, and so that sometimes uh, impacts our logistical uh, ability to collaborate and uh, it also makes us less efficient than we could be. So the example that I was citing earlier is our district office. And um, in this detailed example, we can see a list of challenges we face uh, at just the district office alone. Um, our amazing MOT uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Sam, has put together uh, and is in the process of refining a preliminary cost estimate with the total that will be in the millions of dollars in order to be able to bring this building uh, up to standard. So that brings us to a general summary of Based on our current administrative uh, functions, our facilities use approximately 60,000 square feet of administrative space across the district. Um, one of the suggestions is that we may want to consider consolidating some of these spaces so some of the departments are not split amongst different uh, specific campuses. Uh, that obviously impacts their ability to collaborate and, and the lack of efficiency. Um, so we would actually also suggest that cost estimates for repairs and upgrades, um, if we look at those, if we we're commissioned to do that, uh, the totals could be exceed more than $15 million, uh, which is obviously a significant impact to the budget and something that we should begin planning for earlier than waiting to the last minute. Um, if the board would consider such, uh, staff recommends that we commission a space utilization and adequacy analysis that with its findings would be presented to the board at a future meeting. And that concludes uh, my presentation at this point and we'll yield to public comments. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Dr. Hernandez, Alexander, do we have any public input on this item? No, we do not. Okay, we'll start with Trustee Lee. Um, more comments than questions. Um, so my, my mother-in-law served on this board in the 90s and they were looking for a district office since then. Um, so I think the time has come that I think we need to make a, a plan and a budget to figure out what we're gonna do with the district office. And I don't think, I mean, obviously efficiencies is one thing, but at this time it's just dollars and cents, right? Um, the cost to, to buy a newer building or a, a, a building that's already been rehabbed is gonna be significantly less than rehabbing the building that we have. Um, and I don't wanna to get to a point where the air conditioner breaks or the, the elevator completely fails to where we're forced to spend millions of dollars on a building that is beyond its useful life. So um, I'd like to hear from staff at a future point about uh, how much it's gonna cost to find a building that would serve the needs uh, and then how we would pay for that. And if we don't have the funds now, then obviously looking at a future bond. Um, I would like to look also at um, the space utilization inadequacy study, I think that's what you called it. Yes, sir. Um, and is that something we have to do, we have to hire someone externally, we, we can't do that internally? With the staff that we currently have, absolutely, because it'll be pretty extensive, but then the other, what my recommendation would be is to hire someone in order to be able to expedite something like that, so you have something to begin to consider and, and uh, plan from. Okay. And so what we'd like to do is it's an analysis of the space throughout the district, and are the spaces right-sized, and how, what the adjacencies and other synergies that we could be uh, combining in that type of a study. All right, so I, I think if, you, if, if that's what staff thinks, I think that's the direction we should probably move in. And some recommendations, because I don't think we need to bring, you know, everybody under roof, on one roof, but who we think needs to be under the same roof, ideally, and then, you know, second choice and third choice, so that um, when the funds are available and we're making a move to find a new space, should that be the direction the board wants to go in, we know what our options are based on budget. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. 
Thank you, Mr. Williams. I, I would be interested in hearing um, just a, a, a guesstimate of what it would cost to rehab our building. But are you saying that we would have to hire someone just to get those estimates, or is that something we can do in-house? Um, I can give you a guesstimate. Um, actually, like I said, Sam has done some exemplary work in a very short amount of time uh, to be able to do that. Um, roughly, uh, in the order of magnitude of six to eight million dollars, depending on the systems. And you saw some of the systems that I identified. Uh, the HVAC system, system in particular is very antiquated. Mm -hmm. The elevator really is has got its own sets of challenges. Uh, the stairways and other systems within the building, the restrooms and so forth, as far as ADA compliance. So, I mean, when you put those all together, I think Sam's analysis is right on target. I think we're certainly in the stadium. We may not be on the 50-yard line, uh, and I think that Sam would need a little bit more time to help refine it with maybe the support of maybe an architect or an engineer. Okay, so we're t the, the, the guesstimate we landed on is $15 million. is that it? Am I making that up? So I wrote are down we betting 15. lunch on this or? No, I no, just I'm wrote kidding. down 15 and I'm trying to remember where I got that from. <laughs> so I was, oh, so what I assumed is a number uh, that would be for all of the remaining sites. So just the district office alone would be the six to eight million dollars that I'm quoting here. Oh. But the 15, I think that's what the known elements are. And again, we believe that we need to have a little bit more time to be able to do this. Uh, this was something that we began to discuss, as you all know, uh, and to be, to be able to consider this as something we would bring forward. Um, so we've done a lot of good work, but I think with a little bit more time and a little bit more effort, we'd bring it back to a, a more comprehensive report if the board so chose. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just don't want to spend a whole lot of money on... I mean, I guess, we, I guess, I don't, I guess if you're trying to get to a real, doll, to a real dollar amount, that's important. Um, but... Yeah, I'm, I'm a little hesitant about paying someone for that. And so what we do is, um, before we actually execute with the superintendent's permission, we'll put that in the Friday letter uh, and to be able to kind of let you know what we're thinking of as far as costs before we actually go out on a limb. And then that way we can get some feedback and she can direct us as far as what she'd like to do at that point. Is that okay? Thank you. Do you want to... No, just a, a quick comment, and that is that uh, that I fully support that uh, uh, staff's recommendation to do uh, space utilization and adequacy study. I think it's uh, it's we've known it as uh, uh, Mr. Lee said, and we've known it for a long time that uh, that uh, we we have some necessary needs. Uh, let's take a, a good. Uh, concrete look at w uh, what those needs are, what those costs are, so we uh, know what we're uh, what we're talking about. I would uh, echo my colleague's sentiments. I think we need to know what we're dealing with, uh, frankly, uh, and you know, regarding the consolidation, hopefully those could be potential synergies, uh, not just financially but operationally, if our district can be more cohesive and and you know. Uh, be more coordinated with our, our, our operational and programmatic activities. But the, the big thing also besides having a better sense of what our liabilities are, what are the consolidation and synergies is, uh, you know, how are we going to pay for it, obviously. And so um, we, we're obviously not going to use Measure O money, obviously. And so what options do we really have? Um, that's, that's really going to be important um, but we need to know what we're dealing with so uh, thank you I, I don't think there's any further input but you have direction to study this issue further yes sir thank you thank you okay uh, so that takes us uh, to our meeting conclusion and so I'll ask my colleagues if there's any items that they want to request for future meetings okay hearing none uh, tonight, we adjourn in memory of Annabelle Montoya, Montoya, who was an RUSD retiree who worked in the district from 1996 to 2012. In addition to this, she was also the mother of CSCA's current chief union steward, Norbert Montoya. So we adjourn the meeting in her uh, loving memory at 9.24 p.m.